welcome to Flat Earth Debate Uncut and After Show. I'm your host Nathan Oakley and if you are new to this channel or you've not done so already then be sure to subscribe, hit the bell notification icon and join button if you'd like to become a Nathan Oakley 1980 channel member and keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. If you would like to support the channel, there is a super chat that runs alongside each of these shows while they premiere, and there's also a PayPal, Patreon, and crypto link in the info box below the video. Also below this video, you can get £50 for swapping your UK electricity supplier to Octopus Energy. Speaking of patrons, I'm going to do a quick shout out to all of you who do support me on Patreon. So, a massive shout out of thanks and appreciation to Maximum Gravy, Austin Witsit, John Kays, DL Hill, Julian Jeremiah, Michael Kahn, Patrick Gunnels, Banter, Will Brax, Melby Styles, Troy Shuka, Bo's Nail, Samson, Maris, Mo, uh, Harry Blade, Mobile Max 777, Neo The One, Lost Cat FE, Rob W, Open Minded, Reese Pound, Del West Watson, Mike, Dick Earth Skeptic, Maria Neeland, Unbelievable Productions, Blue Ridge Ranger, The Real Gabster, Liam Nedrick Jr., Abraham Mohammed, Nyby, Adrian Quintana, Skeptic936, Life is Short, Fireball X, the Flat Earth Channel.com, Texas Mike, Edwin Johnson, and David Wayne Foster. So another massive thank you to all of you for supporting me on Patreon. Now I'm going to hand over to whoever is in Discord and Google so you can enjoy their conversation while I set up for today's live show. I didn't account for the 10 minute wait for the elevator. So like I may have a ticket on my car. Hey John, how's it going? Oh. Where have you. you been, John? Mike's not working. Oh, oh there sorry we go. guys. Hello. Good to have you. Mike. Uh, it's just for today. I'm got a doctor's appointment. You're here today because you've got a doctor's appointment today, so you're not busy with other things, you mean? Yeah, I got work today. Fair enough. Well, it's nice to have you. Hey, you know... We haven't seen you, know you for a while. Somebody's, so I was going to say, you know when somebody's missing, when my wife asks me, where's the other guy, John, been? Here in spirit. What do you want? Yeah. Hey, hey Nathan, uh, uh, may I ask you a question? Which can? It's very. Check one, two. Uh, hello, Eli. Hey, hello, 10th. I think it was Brian that mentioned the sky being flat in the section. Um, proves that, right? Now, That's due to true. angular size change, like a hallway, right? You know how it appears to ramp down. You take that hallway and you're in the center of that axis and you spin it do a 360 panorama right due to angular size change and things ramping down would you agree that that could make out like a dome like structure tenths causing a bit of background um do i agree that the sextant proves we can have a dome i don't really follow that logic you'll have to explain it to me N no okay so if i take four planes right and put them above me and i take four other planes and put them further but they're all level to each other the planes that are further away will appear due to perspective and angular size change they will ramp down they will appear to ramp down you spin it in a circle and it would appear like a dome like structure but it's just going in a circle just like how the ceiling in a hallway appears to ramp down to your uh, eye level and you yeah. spin it and do a whole circle. That's what I'm getting at. Oh, um, like an optical. Uh, uh, why don't you do it? Uh, oh, yeah, I did one. do it. I did it with a couple Globers, and they get the understanding of how when they were looking at it, it was like, oh wow, I see that, and they understood it. And then I showed them how you get that left to right, and then you look north, you get to right to left type of uh, direction as well. All you've done so far is just describe how things do actually appear to us, though. Yep, sure did. 
I had Kosho actually, when I did do that, I got Kosho to finally admit that they can't use the sky anymore to tell the shape of the earth. I should have had it recorded. That's all good. So is that all you wanted to know? That what you're describing is actually yeah, was, is representative of what yeah. we see? Because it is. It's how our eyes work. Sure is. He didn't make a further conclusion, so I'll make one. So further to that, the sky appears to be flat. Yes. We, we have an apparent flat sky. Yes. Yep. It just due to our perspective and how angular size change works and things, how our optics work. It just appears like a dome. In a slight sense. Yeah, the effect of it dropping away from you would give you the impression that you've got a dome view of things. But that's just the way your eyes work it doesn't mean that it's in any way related to how it actually is it's not actually a dome like i just say it's appearance would suggest it's flat now does that mean i know what the sky is or know what the stars are no it doesn't but that's how it's also used that's the point right that's how the sextant's utilizing it right i just wanted to add that in so nathan so nathan you wouldn't you wouldn't say that there's a dome would you nathan Wow. I don't know what the sky really? is. I'd say there's got to be containment. And if people say the word dome, I've got no objection to people using that word if they mean what I mean when I say containment must be must be in place for us to have gas pressure. So while I don't use that word, I don't really have any objection to other people using it. Well, it's not. It's It's a claim that you'd have to substantiate, right? Oh, I can do that. If if you were to go out and make that claim, I can, I don't I can do that. Did you not hear me? I can do that. Claim. I can do that. Oh, it's going to be a sink cleanse today. I can do that. <laughs> so so we we have gas pressure. Oh Thank no you. no! Are you no, saying time gas out, pressure time gives time you hold, a dome? Come out, back up, back up, back up. A dome seems to be a shape. Obviously, flat is not a shape. So, um, saying that it appears to measure the way that it measures. Uh, um, it's not like we would be making a claim to a shape, but dome seems to have a shape. I wouldn't be doing that, but whatever. Fair enough. There's a lot of flat earthers that don't claim a dome. And I've never really even heard Nathan ever claim a dome for as long as I've heard it. Now, the implication is that some flat earthers would describe a dome but I've not heard anyone on this panel really make that claim. But there is that implication out there that I think most people would draw. I'll give you props. What we're talking. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me give him props. Yeah, kudos. You've, you've recognized something that's laid as a trap so that when less mm -hmm. intelligent folk than yourself, let's just say, ascribe a straw man dome to me, because we haven't claimed it, I just immediately ascribe it to them because they're the one inevitably who will say it exactly now, you, fra you phrased it in a way that was clever enough to get around it by very specifically carefully phrasing it as a question to me which i hope i answered satisfactory satisfactorily you did yes yeah because the I... implication is that oh, flat earther claims a dome and i've never once heard you on this show for as long as i've listened to it ever make that claim but it's just spectacular to hear that people will well, imply that from what you've never said. And I don't know well, where is it, get that from. Is it really flat? Well, I mean, I'm not going to say that flat earthers don't, but a lot of people are followers. And I'm pretty sure that the images of um, space flat, whatever that is, with the dome over it, I'm pretty sure that was there before um, I came to this topic. And that might be the same for everyone else. I, I, not everyone else, but a lot of people who've come into this conversation five years or less. Okay, I'm getting Hold in. On. I claim there's a dome, but I do it Hold on, sir. It's chops. Same here. It, it is a log It's a logical inference to draw from.
from you can't have gas pressure without a container to say that we are contained. That is that's, logical. Well, I just want to specify. Hold on, everyone calm down. Nathan that's, hold on, never hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on. Okay. Hello. That's what that's what Pope Sink Cleanser just said. So he, he it's that, that was what he just said, John. That was almost verbatim what he said. A lot of people would take that. Okay. I was going to latch on to his last statement, and you've stated it like he didn't. He did say exactly that. So a lot of people would take that to be the logical inference, yeah? Or, AKA yeah. what I described to you as my little trap, if you will. Yes, they would, Sinclenser. Take that as the logical inference. Why would that be, I ask you? They need a straw man. And but, they're going to uh, use... Hold on, hold on. Uh, hold, on, hold, on hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I asked you why it would be a logical inference, not why people would take it as a straw man. Why would it be the logical inference that there would be containment, a.k.a. dome, in this particular, you know, questioning session? Well, well that's, a, that's a question I wanted to ask you, Nathan, because you're one of the few flat earthers since Can I answer that? ever make the claim of a dome. No, just that. Hold on. And Everyone I've else. Everyone, that. Look, it's, it's calm until now. Pope, 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 Pope. Trying to clear the airwaves for you. Sorry. Everyone else, just let him respond. Let's keep it nice and calm. If you do need to jump in, Try and pick a gap to, to, to interject, to ask, to jump in. Go ahead, Pope. I'm sorry. Well, I, I've just listened to this. I listened to the housekeeping a lot, and I've heard Nathan for a long time. He's never once in all the time that I've heard him ever make the claim that this, uh, that container, which most flat earthers imply is a dome, I've never heard him actually make the claim that there's a dome. We and got, we got that. most of the time, it's a Glober straw manning flat earthers into thinking that they believe in that. And I've never heard Nathan ever say that. Yeah, we got all that too. So then you said most people would take that as a logical inference. And I asked, why? Yes. why? Yeah, yeah. No, I want you to expand on that. Why would you say that? Not about the straw man that people hold up. Why would it be a logical inference? Because um, as a couple of different panel members already spoke up eager to say... They believe in the dome. No, no, not the, no, 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 that's not a logical, no, 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 I haven't asked you about belief, and I haven't, no, no, stop, 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 don't be unreasonable, come on, I'll ask you a third time, let's see if you can address it, if I really break it down, hopefully you'll really open your ears, peg him back, you said, right, it's a logical inference to infer that, now regardless of your title, dome or containment, right, that bit I'm not focusing on, I know you wanted to then, and we'll try and steer you back on track. Why would it be a logical influence that we would require any titled containment? Why would that be a logical inference, Sinclenser? The containment would be logical. The dome shape would be a straw man. Yeah, and why Jesus. would it be logical? Yeah, try it fourth time. Everyone else yeah. try and calm down, please. Everyone else making it harder. Why would it be a logical inference? Uh, because of the gas pressure needing containment. Oh, right. So, right. Uh, wow. everyone else, yeah. for the love of Jesus Christ, shut up. So, so when you asked me for proof and I said the gas pressure, you wholeheartedly agree and totally see the logic behind that then? Absolutely. I think you're right on that. You do me need too. gas pressure. Yeah, yeah. Glad you see it our way. Well, no, <laughs> your way isn't the way of it. Are you implying... Hold on, hold on. This is the question here. Neil, 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 hold on, Sinclenser. Right? It's the third time I've said, please, please, clearly, he's giving us a really important concession. Can it not wait? Thank you. Go ahead, Sinclenser. Well, I, listen, I'm like, I'm right. I've listened to this show, I don't know how many times, and I understand the gas pressure needs a container, but. The needing the container as the prerequisite for gas pressure does not then therefore necessitate a dome. And I've never heard you ever claim a dome, Nathan. No, and containment. Just, so so far, yeah, that's, that's fine. That okay, man. okay. You don't have to use that straw man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So we've got gas pressure. That means must have containment. So no sky yes. vacuum then. Absolutely. Yes, I agree. You're Glober. But that doesn't mean it doesn't mean dome. I didn't say it did. Like you keep pointing out. That's but... why I, 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 was, <laughs> I was complimenting you that you've never said dome. Right, but you appreciate sp you appreciate space is fake though. 
Yes, I'm right there with you on pretty much. Okay, you don't think flat earthers get straw manned by the dome argument, Nathan? Come on, I don't of course care. They do. Don't care about this either, right? Who cares? You, you're a globe believer but I'm, I, who appreciates space. No, space. no, no, Neil. No, oh, no, 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 no. God. Because you're calling him a glober. He is not. He's a flat earther. Not Holy a, shit, Nathan. I'm a flat earther. Oh, right. Well, that makes this a bit moot then, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, this is great. Uh, well, the thing is, this guy cannot be a vacuum. In order for this guy to be a vacuum, he needs to be contained. Oh, oh, so one more time, George. Well, this I, this is like flat earth conversation, I think. George. Well, the thing is here, man, I will invoke a dome. I, I think there is a dome. I don't care what any Glover would say. I don't, my, my well, so then what is the point of you doing your little spinning the, the hallway thing then? Jesus Christ. Can I can I ask my question? Yeah, that's nice. So uh, <laughs> to, um, this this week, um, five planets, a.k.a. wandering stars, a.k.a. we don't know what stars are other than lights that we can see in the sky, five of them will be visible this week. So someone, and now I don't, I don't like memes at all, but someone said, hey, and I'm sure you guys heard this before, why is it that I can see Venus at nighttime? Now, some arguments are that, well, it's just before uh, dawn or just after dusk. And I'm like, that picture that he took looks well within twilight, my man. The only thing I need to do is watch, observe, and see for myself because then... All I did was go. I mean, look, there must be some sort of 3D software that can help me out. I don't know, but from the cartoons that I can Google, the ones that the layman will find, uh, Venus has a particular orbit around the sun that is tighter than the Earth's, and so it's closer, right? So it's never on the dark side. Of the, I don't see how you would be able to see Venus. I don't okay. know. Personally, maybe someone can help. Well, this is shout out to Eric DeBay, right? So Eric DeBay put out about a three, four minute video recently about exactly this with a few diagrams to depict his point that he's made clearly enough for you to rattle it off in as concise a way as he did, if not more concise. Now, his postulation is that based on the heliocentric sun at centre, Earth spinning around it model in a vacuum, the two planets, that would be Mercury and Venus, that are sun side of Earth, can't be seen during the night time. That's his postulation. Now, I haven't seen it modelled, so I don't care. We don't live on a model, even if it did or didn't. But there we go. That's his his um, contention, Eric DeBay's and now Eli's. So, yeah, if somebody can explain to me how this model works, I'm not going to... It pains me to repeat that, but that's what you're putting forward, so I'll just say it. So if someone can explain how their heliocentric sun at centre, begging the question, sky vacuum model works with the two inner planets, then feel free. We don't need to look at the sky to prove flat Earth. I hate that. I hate looking at stars. Why? And Venus. Who, who said that you do? Who said that you do? Neil? I'm just saying, me personally. Oh, I know I you're just saying. Sky. I know you're just saying. But I like to look at the sky a lot. So beautiful. So do I. Today it was beautiful. There was a zillion stars out when I left my house at four o'clock. Why this do morning. you speak up about things that you dislike? Because for no I reason. Won't. Because why am I going to look up to prove what I'm standing on? Okay, let me let me well, ask real you a quick. Question. I like to let me ask you. Let me ask you <laughs> well a question. Well done, done. What okay. what Go does ahead, a plane life. have to do with heliocentrism? Because as far as I'm concerned about their cosmology. That has things that should coincide with what they're saying, right? But they don't. We know they don't. So then why on earth <laughs> would you tell me that I can't point that out? I never did. So you then why are you straw me, right? me? Okay, guys, thank you. Thank you. thank you. That's enough. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Don, Gio, go ahead. Yeah, I like to reel it back. Uh, Eli Strongman, my uh, claim, yeah, I used the uh, hallway for an example, but I didn't give a description or shape to the dome. See, a dome could be flat. It could be any type of shape. Yeah, Still Eli. A dome can't be flat. Yes, it can. 
Well, I, I, I wanted to ask no. a question I, I about this too. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm interested too. Can I respond? Hold on. What's this flat dome you speak of? Go ahead. <laughs> flat dome? Yeah, canopy. A canopy could be flat with uh, curved edges at the uh, ends. Hold on, that's a totally different a word there. Hold on. Flat. Hold on. That's a different word. <laughs> Just explain what a canopy is. <laughs> Wait, hold on. <laughs> How is that Lexus a Ferrari? Well, this here Lamborghini. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm into the semantics on this one. You need to give me a definition. Can I Come on, on. Just you know, exactly. thing. I mean, doesn't the doesn't the recent conversations about the sexton actually demonstrate that this guy has to be flat? It would appear so. Yes. Yes. Yes, like a, I agree. Like a canopy. So that rules out a dome. <laughs> no, well, no it, that's it, it, uh, what, that's how wide is the dome? Them. No, it, it got, begs the question. Nobody how said wide, dome. Hang, Nobody has said dome. Hansen. So it begs the question, how wide is that dome? I want to correct See, you. a dome can be very extremely wide and appear flat in appearance. I specifically asked Nathan Whoa, if he out. believed Whoa. in a dome. No, no, address what I've he never just heard said. Anyone address on this what oh, Look, just everyone said. stop rumpusing the globe believer. Pink, pink. Uh, go ahead, single answer. Don't call me a globe believer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a dome believer, flatter. <laughs> but he's just wasting time. He's not even Guys, can everyone what? please clear the airwaves? Single answer wants to tell us all about his dome belief as a glober. Oh, yeah, okay, God. so. Having listened to Nathan Ugly for several hundred episodes, I've never heard him once ever Hell make no. a claim. Hell no, Nathan. He's Arch, just well, I'm, I was almost there, exactly. Elijah. I know you're gritting at it, right? I've never heard Nathan ever make the claim that the sky is dome. You said this ten times, Shin Cleanser. Come on. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. So, so, so why are you guys presupposing that it exists? No, I'm just I, suggesting. I wanted can to do, we only thing I wanted to Nobody do made the claim. Point out. Can I we rule it out with the sextant? I want to talk to Geo, please. Go ahead. He just said something, and I want to respond to the guy who actually said something. Go ahead, Eli. So you said a canopy can be so large that it appears flat. What does that mean? That it's not? Yeah, the the, the center of it would appear smoothly flat. It will extend so far. The flat plane will be so vast. The shape of the firm, you know, the dome. I say firm. Why would you but do that? The nah. center of it will, it will flatten out. That's how. <laughs> Donnie, why it's, would you it's, do it's, that? You sound no. like a globe. Oh, hold why on, not? hold on. Hold on, hold on. So you're saying it's so massive that it appears flat, though it's not. Let me let me get that clear. Right. It appears flat, but it's not. Right. No way. Oh. Um, and how do you know? How do you know that that's what the sky is? He doesn't. Containers because the way walls. the stars work. Okay, now with what about a size change? Hey, we need to hear his answer. What's that? We need to hear his, your answer, Don. Go ahead. With angular size change, right? Like the hallway, things in the distance appear to go below. Well, they go. They meet eye level. That is flat. That would be a flat uh, structure, a level structure, uh, no point higher than the other. And it does a 360 around you. It would give that dome-like structure be, that's flat, but it also um, distorts. It bends downwards, giving a firmament-like feature. Mm. And it hasn't clicked yet that that this is the globus argument for the supposed <laughs> reason why we it haven't has. seen the curvature when it's locally flat, but it's obviously not uh, flat. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. But I do like to show you. You're not right. saying that, Neil. You think you live in a dome world. What Neil. does the sextant tell us about the sky, though? We don't live in a dome world. All right? Nathan. Nathan. We definitely Nobody have a ever claim. There's no proof that we do. How could please, you prove that? Please, 10th man, help, help us out. How yes, could you prove we live in a dome? I mean, yeah, good okay. luck. If you're going to claim oh, dome, gosh. you're going to have to prove it. I don't hear anybody claim dome. Can I get a sound check? Oh, I don't like flatter straw men that attack. we all think that we live on a, in a dome world. Hold on. Let's just get 10th man sound check done. 
Yeah, Nathan, I'm in a different place today. Uh, I'm just wanting to make sure I don't disturb the show. I'm on my phone. Is this coming in good? Sounds good to me. Okay. Um, I put two slides, Master B. The celestial sphere is there, rhetoric. Okay. They have that imaginary celestial sphere. And they're the ones with all their depictions that show all the images of a dome around them. I put a picture of that. Just go to that. I'm, I'm going to go on mute for a minute. Right and you up. can read the first. Yeah, you can hang on. I'm on my phone, so I got to get off this page. Hold on. Russell, Russell. All right. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, yeah, there we go. All right, so you see the picture of uh, the blue plane with the four cardinal points and then the dome, you see that? Is that the first image? Yeah. Yeah, I got that up. Yeah, okay, so who put this up? Why, why are there so many that look like this? Uh, this isn't a flat earth uh, claim or sight. This is how they say the sky appears to you. And this is, you, you will see these images everywhere. Now, if you go to the article, in astronomy and navigation, the celestial sphere is an imaginary sphere of arbitrarily large radius, concentric with Earth. That's, see, concentric with Earth. Okay, they're trying to say it's the same sphere. Earth, all objects in the observer sky can be thought as projected upon the inside surface of the celestial sphere as if it were the underside of a dome. Done. debate live i'm your host nathan oakley and if you are new to this channel or you've not done so already then be sure to subscribe hit the bell notification icon and join button if you'd like to become a nathan oakley 1980 channel member and keep up to date with the flat earth debate if you would like to support the channel there is a super chat that runs alongside each of these shows while they are live and there's also a paypal patreon and crypto link in the info box below the video also, below this video, you can get £50 for swapping your UK electricity supplier to Octopus Energy. Most importantly, if you'd like to join the discussion, simply mute the page you are currently watching, then click the link in the info box below this video to join the panel and express your views on the nature of Earth. If you do join, please don't swear. If you do, you'll be ejected. And if you are, please don't try to rejoin the stream using sock accounts. You'll be warmly welcomed back on the next stream. Please also share the show on social media. Sharing the show obviously increases the live audience, but this in turn increases the chances of a more diverse panel. So please share the show on Facebook and Twitter. Now we are joined by Eli, 10th man, father of a stolen child. And I can't see my screen because the Skype page is in the way. <laughs> We've also got Neil, 10th man, chocolate saying, and a whole bunch of people in Discord. So welcome one and all. Good morning, good morning. Hey, Nathan. Yo, yo. Good morning, all. Good afternoon. Yo. Hello. How are you? How are you? Chick Very well. to behave today. He's going to be well uh -oh. behaved. Well, I want to make an argument. I don't know if you guys want to run through the housekeeping, oh, but... Well, we'll start with... Man, any... we were on to something good. Any evidence that you can have gas pressure without the necessary antecedent of a container to press upon? 
man. That's a negative. Not a dome, but yes. You oh, need you a container. Oh, man. You're gonna need three containers at least to demonstrate that. I'll give you container, know, for, but for I'm some not. Some strange gonna... reason. Okay, does a container have a shape to it? Well, for some strange reason, all the gas laws that we know about presuppose a container, as said by certain Glober. But why do you think that is? Because you need a container. Oh shit! Look at that. There's no gas law that says we need a dome. Hey, okay, that was my about point here. Welcome to flat Earth. Well, that was <laughs> erroneous. That was erroneous, but Geo did want to say something. Go ahead, Geo. Right? Doesn't a, that Geo container mind. have a shape? Hello, guys. It doesn't have to have any specific uniform shape, no. I mean, it's going to be physical and have a shape to it in the respect that it's got to be physical and have parameters that give it containment. But you know, does it have to be? Oh god, do I have to say this? Dome shaped? <laughs> no, it doesn't have to be dome shaped. Can I also give my well, two cents there I, with that? Uh, uh, Zen cleanser, thank you. Um, so I was going to compliment Nathan, but go ahead. So I'm I'm going to ask an array of questions. Well, it may it may be only three, but is flat a shape or is it a description? Yeah. An aspect. As a aspect. description. Aspect. Okay, well, seeing aspect, that we can't it. see the entire Earth, we can't describe it as an object because, well, we haven't seen the whole thing, correct? Correct. Would it be um, reasonable to say you haven't seen the structure of the containment either? Therefore, though it could be, well, though it has to be a shape, um, we wouldn't know what shape that is. You don't know what I correct. don't know. Coulda, woulda, shoulda. Right, but we can use the sextant um, to say, well, the part that we do utilize um, seems to be flat. Can we say that? Right. Okay. Yes, I agree. No further question. Not seems to be, must be for that tool to work. Uh, I was trying to give you a little bit. Uh, there you go. Must be. <laughs> so, so it demonstrates that the sky is parallel with the ground? That's correct also, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, cool, yes. cool. A appears to be. Careful with your words. Sure. <laughs> yeah, the apparent position of the stars, not the container. Yeah, and the apparent position of those stars is useful to derive 90 degrees when you measure your angle to them from any position on the flat plane we dwell atop. But how could they, what, call, uh, it, how could they call it a celestial sphere? Like, exactly. if it was a sphere, was then the stars should be almost curving on this periphery. And they if say... they're actually starlight located billions of light years, there'd be no curving to assume a celestial sphere in the first place. Yeah, they hijacked. I thought we covered this. It? Didn't we cover this on the pre show? They've hijacked perspective. The fact that they've done it in the begging the question proof of nothing perspective hijacking Earth curve calculator doesn't mean they're not going to employ the exact same trick when they're doing it with the stars. You know, the linear relationship that they translate with R that Adam was detailing a couple of days ago is a good example of that. You want my take on it? Their Earth curve is still just a their Earth curve is still just a slope. Like they're only arguing for a slope. <laughs> Certainly when you look at linear but, perspective yeah. or the stars in terms of their descriptions for them. Other than they're begging the question translation that doesn't work, inserting R and starting at the centre of a presupposed spherical Earth when you describe it in degrees. No, you, you've got a slope, as you put it. You know, you've got a linear relationship. Right, right. that's like, into the distance that's like what you... Go ahead. Hold on, hold on. Tenth Man was trying to get a word in there. Go ahead, Tenth. Yes, uh, we just read a citation that said it's an imaginary sphere. They even admit it's an imaginary sphere. They use it because they're ballers now. What Nathan's answered is the correct answer, which is perspective. See, the perspective is, as you get further away, and we know what happens as you get further away. That's a, our argument. And so that what they're using it for is to kind of get rid of perspective and say, this is the way it is. Mm. <laughs> Meanwhile, the globe yeah. is now telling us, <laughs> perspective, guys. Hey, you guys forgot about optics. <laughs> you know, that's the anti-flat earthers that are telling us, oh, perspective. 
and uh, we welcome to them flat earth when they do so. <laughs> well, I, I noticed Nathan Nathan called out once, um, and I think it's one of Nathan's best arguments on this show. And I, I know a lot of the panel members also echo that opinion, is that the Muppet Vision worldview really sneaks in a whole bunch of different aspects of reality that they can't talk you into based on perspective. So they have to sneak in a lot of their worldview through the Muppet Vision um, trick kind of thing. And, and that, that that's it's good to call that out, though. Yeah, they've started doing it with Double Team. So they've got Rumpus and Bev, and Rumpus is insisting that a Muppet Vision representation with an R assumption is going to be utilised for every explanation, and it must be accepted thereafter once presented. Then he takes a sidestep as George Nettenyuk comes in and starts talking about optics, very separate from the optical exclusive Muppet vision that Rumpus is insisting on using. So George discusses the optical <laughs> elements. Rumpus insists on begging the question with Muppet vision. <laughs> it's like they, uh, it's, it's very amusing to watch. Well, if I could reel it back when you were talking about linear functions, right? Um, Shout out to Kiwi for this, though. And, uh, Tenth Man might be able to point this out as well. So the angle to Polaris will change one degree every 69 miles, right? Yeah, this is a little crossroads, but yeah, go ahead. So it's a linear. Isn't the vertical drop eight inches per mile squared? That's correct. Are squared functions linear? Yes, that's correct. They give you a suggestion at this point. They'll give you a suggestion that it's still moving around a sphere because, well, degrees, right? We're not going to rehash this. We covered this extensively right. the other day. Yeah, they're just giving you a slope. That they don't. They didn't account for refraction. We found out that they didn't know how to account for refraction with Alberuni. So I don't know how they can claim that refraction does this or that if they never even implied it to begin with when they first made their claim. No, no, no. C careful so... again. When when you say Alberuni <laughs> hasn't accounted for it. He, he he can't and must not be considering refraction. He's measuring geometry. So it's exactly. absurd to say, well, did he factor it in? No, no, no. He's measuring geometry, right? That's what he's supposed to be doing. Now, the fact that he had to get the height of the mountain off a flat plane to begin with is just so epic. I mean, I'm so, so happy when Adam told me that. I couldn't quite believe my ears when he highlighted it about a week ago. But yeah, so even to assume he's measuring geometry, that's not refraction, that's geometric measurements he's taking. He had to assume that he was on a flat plane first to get the height of the mountain. <laughs> Epic. <laughs> well, the, well, Kiwi once said, and, and uh, he said in an after show one time, he said that, you know, when the, when the, when the ballers say bindi crane refraction, when it comes to the black swan, that's already been accounted for in the argument. When you start saying refraction, you're appealing to their model, which implies a radius value. So it's like a, like another level of genius, I think, well, I, I, in terms of the art. I find it quite amazing when they invoke refraction 7 over 6 R with standard refraction, or they always say extreme, extreme refraction, but it still will not relocate that physical sphere edge no matter what refraction they try to invoke. No, it, it, it's not about it being capable of relocating it. The moment it's being relocated, it stops being geometric. Now, their assertion right. relies upon tangent points, having a straight line to that tangent point, and that tangent point being their Earth curve. So the moment they even attempt to refract it, regardless of the fact that they utilise paradoxically the R value that needs it to be geometric to be measured and yep. then utilised in 7 over 6R terrestrial refraction in its standard form, or extreme refraction if you want to change the value, again, based on R and based on having a physical tangent point horizon, i.e. Earth curve supposed to be the horizon, tangent point for your geometry that you're asserting when you say it blocks things. Yeah, that all goes to hell the moment they say, oh, it's refracted. So not a geometric tangent point then. Bye-bye, Globondle. End of argument. 
Yeah, as soon as I, I, I and, said that before, and now they as soon as they unvote us, refraction. Oh, go ahead. And now, they, and now they ask us, why would you expect to see this geometric horizon that Al Biruni was supposed to be calculating and measuring? This is the point that we've reached, guys. <laughs> Which is roughly translated as, why would you expect to see Earth Curve? That thing I said physically blocked things in the distance based on this geometry and having a tangent point to it. Why would you expect to see that tangent point to it? I claim block boats and buildings because you told me it blocked boats and buildings. That's why. What, you're telling me it doesn't and it's refracted? Well, then it's not geometric and that's the end of your geometric earth curve assertion right. with a physical horizon to block things. Bye-bye, globe model. Yeah, that's a wrap. It's <laughs> a wrap for all that. That's pretty good. That, that is pretty good. That's what well, I kind of like when they, they say okay. refraction. Your model, if, if you look up um, what um, Andrew, uh, Andrew Thomas Young, he, he says there's sinking refraction and looming refraction. Why is it that the difference between those opposites is a flat Earth? Like, you have both opposites ends of what he would call the refraction over a globe. It equates to what you would see over a flat Earth, incidentally. Well, well, Whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait. Yeah, yeah, Tim, go ahead, Tim. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. Why don't, you, why, don't you read the, why don't you read the disclaimer of Andrew Thomas Young? All his refraction studies were done over a plane, and then he switched it with geometric considerations to fit his globe model. Get him, Ken. I was just going to say it, too. Everything's coming up flat well, these days. Uh, I even found a citation from NASA talking about satellites using a flat plane just fine. It's insane. It's over. Oh, that's great. <laughs> well, it's the, it's the bendy crane. Okay, I'm pretty sure every flat earther here has encountered, oh, the black swan has got the bendy cranes. Right? Okay, that's fine. But having Dude. talked with QE, that's accounted for. It's, that's a part of what we should expect them to be even responding with. Right. Welcome to the party. Because that then they're going to back their question and probably in numerous... Go ahead. Over. Who, who really tried to assert that, as far as I know. And, like, the that other ones just latched yeah. onto what? it because they, they all realized they didn't have any geometry to their sphere edge. <laughs> so all of a sudden it's like, no, nah, no, nah, refraction. That's how it would prove the radius. Well, like the... Wait a minute. Go ahead. Didn't you need the radius to figure out your refraction? Your terrestrial <laughs> refraction? Uh... Yeah. <laughs> I like and to point don't... out what Elijah, Elijah said about um, NASA and their uh, documents. I found an old um, newspaper from Trove.com, and it talks about Dr. Lipsy and the French engineer who finally did the job. They were talking about um, assuming that the Earth was flat and conducted a canal accordingly. And the consequence of this and the act of parliament and was passed the Railways, Powers, and the Construction Amendment Act, 1870, and has not since been rep uh, repealed. So they just assume the Earth, they just went with a flat Earth when they start building. I can uh, give you that, Elijah, if you want it. Yeah, that's the Suez Canal. The English engineers actually rejected the tender uh, to begin with because they would have to account for curvature and they... They didn't really know how to do that, so they rejected the tender. And then the French came fire. along. Hold on. And actually Please, did the job. Hello, hello. Can you not hear almost exactly describing this? Go ahead, almost exactly. Um, I was just saying, after the English rejected the tender, uh, the French came in and uh, did the job, assuming a flat earth. And uh, because of these... Uh, disputes uh the parliament the english parliament uh passed an act which i'm trying to get a hold of uh, of the text and documents i can't find it anywhere i can find uh, the record of it that it, mm. it does exist um but hold can't on. find the hold on hold on the don't, 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 don't tell us about what you haven't found just tell us what the act is and why you would want to find it go ahead well the act uh allegedly um forb forbade uh, any allowance for curvature when building things like railways and uh any construction, which is pretty funny. <laughs> they forbade that gives it. Credence, 
that gives credence to what um, Brian's been saying about um, if you have a curved radius, then you would have a larger diameter circle um, that they don't account for. And I did question him. I was like, well, you know, curved paper, flat paper, isn't it the same? And uh, he explained to me, no. And now what you're saying, it seems that other people that are actual engineers are like, listen, bro, I'm paying for this flat piece of material right here. I don't know what you're on about, but um, I'd like a receipt for this, please. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they passed the act, so no, no more engineers would reject tenders um, based on that claim. And they, it was uh, allegedly passed in 1870. Hopefully we'll Tender have some like sleuths. Money? Hold on. Hopefully some sleuths in the audience will dig this out if it exists, and it'll come to surface, or it'll be pointed out that it's a myth, or whatever. We'll find out. I'm sure. Right. I uh, tag Eli with it. It's trove.com. I'm um, trove gov. So it's in the main chat. Um, just on what Eli said there, that is a if you're about if they're taking a cord through. Uh, if they're pre-assuming uh, a flat by putting a cord through their uh, part of their globe, then the arc is more than the cord in distance. So what, it doesn't work on the surface. Um, they, they could, they, if they were going to build like an assumed curvature, um, it just won't work because <laughs> it's, it's just not curved. <laughs> that's, that's the bottom line. If you're trying to assume curvature, you'll end up going down on the ground. So it'd be the opposite. <laughs> You'd be digging down into the ground to assume your coverage. The, Hello, the, bendy, the bendy cranes is due to what? If if you've heard any of the arguments about the sextant, what do you not do unless you want to bring a lot of work on yourself with refraction? With the sextant, where do you take your sighting? Above what degrees from the 15 horizon? or 20 degrees? Right. So, yeah, exactly. Because anything 0 to 15 or 0 to 20, you're going to have these thermal inversions. You're going to have all kinds of temperature changes, stuff in the air. And it's going to make the star just like the bendy crane. So that's why they say, well, why even hassle with that? Just go above here where it, it's very stable. I've read you the citation. It's so stable that one minute of arc would equal about one nautical mile. You go below that, you're hitting the bigger numbers and you're just gonna be tossing and turning, trying to figure it out when you just need an exact coordinates at sea. Okay. It's Thank just... You. Thank you, that's perfect. But however, I just wanna point out that the black swan argument is about the horizon, right? If the Earth is a sphere, radius 39.59, then every distance to horizon can be no more than 1.2 times the square root of the observer's height in feet, and the distance to the horizon in the black swan image is beyond the geometric limitations of a sphere Earth, radius 39.59. Therefore, the horizon is not Earth curve, and the Earth is not a sphere. Now, anybody hear any mention of cranes in there? Hell no. No. Thank you for addressing The Glober that. position is that bendy cranes. Did you just hear what <laughs> right? I right. Have you not heard oh. that before? Sorry, yes. They, they say, look, there's refraction. And you go, oh, right. So when we're told that we've got a geometric limitation to our view based on radius 39.59 and your maths with tangents to it, it's at actually refracted therefore not geometric then who cares if you've got bendy cranes our argument is about the position of their physically claimed to be earth curve horizon yeah it's about is the horizon geometric no <laughs> that's it isn't it and you, yeah. and you earth, want uh, them to say refraction as well earth curve is you really do want them to say it. earth curve is the geometric horizon you know, you look in their maths, and it's marked with an X, labelled horizon with a straight line to it. Earth curve is their horizon, and it's geometric by their claim. They bring up their geometry to tell you how much it's physically blocking stuff. And then they what? Tell you that it's actually a refracted non-geometric position that can't be measured to get R, and isn't physically blocking things. So what were the boats and buildings blocked by? Refraction was blocking them. So not Earth curve then. 
Well, it couldn't be Earth curves because nope. apparently the geometric horizon only exists in the math. My response to that, there we have only been... have one horizon, and the horizon in the begging the question proof of nothing perspective hijacking Earth curve maths is physical and is geometric. It isn't the horizon that we experience in reality. The horizon is not Earth curve. Would it help anyone if I made the assertion, the actual positive claim that starts this entire argument that a Glover would make? Yes, that would be helpful. The assertion is, is that we live on something with geometry and you can measure that geometry by measuring a dip angle to the horizon and using a tangent to that point to derive a radius, assuming the earth is a sphere. What's a tangent? A tangent is a straight line that, to a right triangle. And what's a tangent point? The point where that straight line meets the sphere. And the point where that straight, that's not refracted. Refracted means deviated from straight. So to be geometric as per the earth curve claim, you need a straight line to earth curve. That's the tangent point. And what's that labelled as? Uh, it'd be labelled as horizon in your geometric maths with its straight line to it. So the moment that line's bent, what's that refracted, deviated from straight, you've no longer got a geometric claim anymore. So no more physical blockages to boats and buildings. Well... If Al Baruni used <laughs> any Euclidean geometry, then technically there was no way that he could do what he claimed to do. Uh, that does not have anything to do with a, a spherical. I just thought of something. Because <laughs> humans are dumb, but not that dumb. But let me let me elucidate what I mean. So Al Baruni is said to have done this, but we all say if he existed, obviously because there's no primary uh sources for for his existence or so that being said when did the radius actually come into being because wouldn't have people figured out that the horizon isn't earth measured or geometric that's what's happening like, now that's what's happening now stacy hot mic no, that's what i'm saying but we need oh, we needed 3959 to say that so I'm wondering when exactly that came into play. Based on primary sources. In terms of when it was first asserted, we can only go by what they tell us, but in terms of when it's first measured, that's Al Biruni. So that's what we focus on. When's it claimed to be physically actualized? That would be measured in physical terms. That's Al Biruni. So prior to that, were they saying it's a sphere? Yeah. They say it's been claimed to be a sphere for all eternity, basically, don't they? We've always known is what they claim. So if you want to peg that down, you're on a wild goose chase. When's it measured? And I want, if he was, is willing, John to repeat exactly what he said before because of the significance and importance I want to lay, lay to it upon repetition. You still there, Father of the Stolen Child, a.k.a. refracted curvature? Yeah, I'd just like to say real quick that if you don't measure it, it's not real. And measure it it is earth curve earth curve being their claim to be horizon geometric in their claim hey and john can you john can you tell us what kept you as a global you've said it once before or a few times before you held on to a global because of what i thought i was measuring something i thought i was making a measurement to you know the geometry of Earth. And what made you realize that you weren't? Because it can't be refracted. It's a constant in the mathematics. It's what the R is, is it's supposed to be a constant. Indeed set in stone both physically and metaphorically if you believe you're standing on a sphere radius 
3959 of the rock that you stood upon and a lot of other things are derived thereafter. Now, if you can't physically attain that through measurement, then how have you got that value? The answer is you haven't. So every subsequent argument or prior argument before the black swan that claimed to have a starting point of a sphere by begging the question, totally unjustifiable, I might add, but that's what they did. We know it's a sphere. How do you know? Because we've got a radius value of 3959 here. It is in our maths. The math says physical obstruction at the horizon. Horizon's earth curve blocking things. Right? Well, that started with an assumption of the R value. Well, where'd you get it? That's what I'm asking you at the moment, isn't it, fundies, in all your chat? Ah, question mark. Where'd you get it? Because you didn't measure it. But that's where your story begins. That hasn't changed, right? It's not like they're altering the storybooks with a claim to be measured dip angle to it. That it is a physical earth curve edge horizon that we've debunked with the black swan. Now, John's story starts with him going, we can measure Earth as a sphere, therefore it's perfectly justifiable to say I'm on a sphere. Until you can't, then it's not. Uh, I'd just like to say that the answer John gave is not 100% correct, uh, or as correct as it could be. The answer is actually uh, honesty and acceptance. That's what uh, changed the, the whole thing. On a so what? He could see this honesty and acceptance, because he could see the same exact proof and be not honest about it and not accept it and just be the same as the rest of the anti flat orders. I was going to say that because John, you know, John doesn't have pride. So when it came to reality, he faced reality. Everyone has pride. It's just a road you pick. Do I want to skirt the road of the hill I've just rolled down, which was a road that is littered with people in pain? Or do I want to veer off that road and just realise that I don't know a lot of the things I thought I did? Why skirt the hill and tell everyone that it's still a sphere in the vain hope that you can scramble back up the hill to ignorance? You can't. Once you're here, and I'm sorry to say this to a lot of people, I mean, I mean Globers that have only just recently realised what's going on around them and suddenly become anti-flat earthers without realising it and fighting for it. I'll give you an example, right? Pat Brittenden. And dragged into this and suddenly he's an anti-flat earther without even realising it. Yeah? Neutral my ass. He's just made a video about Antarctica. Anyway, that aside, he's suddenly rolled down the hill. I bet he didn't want to. He was in blissful ignorance. Based on his attitude, he was like, yeah, we already know. This is laughable. Yeah, And you're like, yeah, but what you don't appreciate is just by having this conversation and being in this arena, you're rapidly rolling down that hill now, aren't you? And now what are you doing at the bottom? Telling us how anti-flat earthers have got a misconception about Antarctica. Yeah, that sounds very much like you're at the bottom of the hill, hoping to climb back up to ignorance. <laughs> you're never going to get there. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's just a very littered, horrible, nasty, swampy-ridden, filthy cesspit at the bottom of that hill. Now, like I say, you can skirt that hill forever, or you can wander off into the green pastures of not unfortunately knowing what everything is anymore. But it's a lot happier. Well, I assume it is from... From my perspective, it certainly is. I hope John will now back me up with that. Oh, yeah. There's uh, there's some wonder to reality now. Perfect word. Hey, Nate. hey Nathan, I've got some slides of mastery I'd like to go over. Okie dokie. You could start with um, the cone-shaped flagpole circle of equal altitude. the angle on top of a sphere with true altitude and observed altitude. Is that the one? No. No, keep going uh, down till you see a blue slide that says circle of equal altitude, and it's got a yellow flagpole with one circle. Okay, got it. Okay. So the black swan in Jan 2020, when I heard it, I instantly got it with QE because I called him up to verify just in case I didn't get it. But after he explained it to me in the private call, I said, oh my gosh, this opens up a huge door. So that's when, because I was into boating, I realized the sextant kept now coming to the argument. So that's when I started the research on the sextant beyond the, you know, the novelty of it that I knew at the time. So 
let's see what the sexton does to bring the ballers back to the black swan because that's the whole point let's go circle of equal altitude that flagpole or you can call it the sun is directly over a spot on the earth and it creates a circle of equal altitude a anyone on that circle has the same degree distance to the gp the geographical position the altitude the zenith the 90 these are all synonymous when they say altitude that means 90 degrees folks zenith that means altitude they all mean directly over a spot on the earth go to the next slide uh, the next slide shows how their muppet vision wants to tell you how this works on the ball well you, you can see they got the true horizon there on on their muppet vision then they got the visible horizon well we all know there's only one horizon but then they'll have three or four more as uh, as we've seen and mitchell does a great job on his uh latest video on the section about how many horizons they use but you can see here that they have that uh, zero line going out under the true horizon. And that star would have to be over the position 90 degrees on that straight line. But they've got it pointing towards the O over here. So this is a lie. This whole thing is a lie right here. Let's go to the next slide. A circle of equal altitude is position circles from GP. You have to go from the GP to you. So position circle of true altitude, the intercept, which is what you got to figure out, and the position circle of calculated altitude, okay? What's that thing in the middle? Oh, radii of circles of equal altitude. Uh, is a radius line straight or curved? Someone, please. Uh, straight. Thank you. So that means that GP, which is, this is an overview, so this is a top level view looking down so you're looking down on the earth here on this picture and you're directly let's say you're the sun and you're directly over that uh, that plus sign that is 90 degrees now you need a radius to the sailor with the sextant which is somewhere on that circle and that radius is straight let's go to the next slide next slide shows that key part of celestial navigation superimposed on a well here it's a two-dimensional circle but they want you to think it's a globe this is an impossibility this picture but this is from their side to trick the navigators so there's gp1 and gp2 where they cross in two places is where the navigator has to be he's either on the top part or the lower part but when you take three sightings then all three circles of equal altitudes cross at one point, and that's your fix. Now think about this. That GP1 could be 5,000 miles from the radius to you, and the 10,000 mile diameter that has to be flat. GP2 and GP3 must observe that as well. So all that is flat, but they've got you thinking it works on a ball. Next slide. Let's go to their address book. It's called the Nautical Almanac. Is a publication describing the positions of selection of celestial bodies for the purpose of enabling navigators to use celestial navigation to determine the position of their ship while at sea. The almanac specifies for each whole hour of the year the position on the Earth's surface in declination and Greenwich hour angle, at which the sun, moon, and planets, and first point of Aries, is directly overhead. The positions of 57 selected stars are specified relative to the first point of Aries. Folks, it's a death blow. The Nautical Almanac is an address book of 90 degree relationship of a star, the 64 navigational stars that you use with a sextant. And the radius line from the GP to wherever you are has to be straight. The black swan is saying what? The sextant is blowing right through that stupid refraction argument that the Globers use and going right to the GP. And all of that has to be straight. I'm done. 
Awesome. Great presentation. Getting slicker and slicker. Yeah. Right. Go ahead, Brian. Oh, As we have a idiot. moment of silence for the death of the globe. Yeah, Brian. Okay. Uh, yo, I had to have that moment. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, um, the diagram with all the different horizons in it. That, is that not the craziest heap of nonsense ever? I mean, the visible horizon, uh, like, they just use the the they just use the fact that your oil line is making uh, parallel with the ocean, right? The ocean is is one flat line, and the oil line is another flat line. That's why they have the horizon dip correction for sextants of the ship of the bit of the uh, deck of a boat, and they then take this what they call a visible horizon, and they bring it down uh, as a tangent to their uh, sphere, and um, and it's going off down, uh, like below your feet. Like it, it can't go below your feet. That's 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 the whole point. Uh, as in, if you're start, when I say below your feet, sorry, it can't go below uh, the sea level. Whereas, where would sea level be? You know, it, it, I, I'm not really saying much about this. It's just it's just cold nonsense. All these different horizons. It's just there's one horizon. That's it. No, you can see there's um, an oil line, oil line horizon. If, sorry, go on, thanks. Uh, I was just going to ask you, it, it, isn't the horizon defined as the visible demarcation between land and sky? Yeah, and there's only one of them. So visible. So then calling an already visible point visible again is redundant, right? Because it's yeah. defined as visible. So saying visible horizon, they're just saying like the visible, visible place where the land meets the sky. That's it just gets so worse. Like... They say we see the apparent oh, we horizon. We see the visible, visible. Yeah, we see, seeing it, seeing it, seeing it. <laughs> Get the papers, the papers. <laughs> Would anybody be able to present me with a painting where the painter painted the true horizon? You know? It's ridiculous. I'll say it again. We only have one horizon, and the horizon in the begging the question proof of nothing perspective hijacking earth curve calculator is physical and geometric. It requires it to be a tangent point with a straight line to it in order to derive our values and give you claims of physical geometric obstructions at the earth curve horizon. The horizon is not earth curve. We've only got one, and it's not your geometric one. You see, when I even... Evoke uh, standard refraction, right? I'm echoing. When they evoke standard refraction, right, so it's an apparent, they won't get a tangent point to that geometric horizon, so they don't have the radius. Correct. If, if I have to say it again for clarity, the GP of a star, which radius to you is 3,000 miles, is a straight line. It doesn't matter optically what your eyes are telling you. For the sextant to work, you have an angle measurement to a uh, luminary in the sky, which the book tells you where it's exactly over at 90 degree relationship to the surface of the earth. That's a perpendicular relationship, which means from the GP to you, that's it. It's one straight line. It doesn't matter, refraction, no refraction, because your eyes can only go, what, three miles, four miles, and the higher you go, maybe more. But you're on the deck of a ship, maybe 10, 15 feet if it's a, if it's a private uh, you know, sailboat, 40, 50 feet if it's a big old ship. You have to minus that uh, f footage, as Brian said, to get to sea level. Once you minus it, the sexton puts you within a half a mile to a mile of the GP of the star. That is impossible if it's curving away from you. And radius lines don't curve. End the story. Yeah, boy, boy, when you do the horizon dip correction, you're stopping things being optical and you're making it geometric then. You're making it physical because you're putting that line onto the surface of 
the water below the boat. So it's not a case of you think you're looking in a straight line. It's that you are putting that vertex onto the surface of the water below the boat to make sure the base of that, surf of that vertex is running along in a straight line along a straight horizontal plane, a physical horizontal plane. There is no refraction involved in that part because you are taking all refraction and all everything else out of the equation by putting your, what has to be a straight line that could stretch for hundreds and thousands of miles in, uh, uh, straight out towards the horizon and past. You're putting that onto the surface of the earth. So that's, the horizon dip correction takes away all optics out of the uh, Just equation. Just expand on what Brian said. So if you're taking the measurement and this circle of equal altitude diagram, from any of these positions so let, let's just say let's just pick one it doesn't have to be any particular one but we'll say this one on the left if you're on a boat and you're taking the measurement from a tower so let's just say it's it's up here approximately i'm going to shout out ben in a second for his super chat thank you very much indeed um then you've got to correct by a height adjustment also called dip correction don't quite know why but there we go it's called dip correction but it's a height adjustment so that the position that you're actually measuring your angle from is actually taken down to the deck so it's basically a height correction so that you can get it with this straight line which is where brian's statement about it not including and can't include refraction is totally correct because this is a straight line it's going to meet the gp at 90 degrees it must for this calculation to function in other words from your feet to the gp of the star must be a flat straight line to do this can't be any other way. Now, it skews the measurement if you take it from here because you're slightly above the deck. Or up here if you're in an aeroplane. Same thing applies. You've got to take it by way of an adjustment to the deck so that you can have an actual straight line meeting the GP on the ground at 90 degrees at this position in this diagram. So that's what Brian's explaining. So if your GP to the star is like, let's say, 2,000 miles away, is that, is that 2,000 miles local? Well, that if you want to call it local or otherwise, means that you've got a straight flat line between your feet when corrections are made for how high you are above the ground to wherever that star is located. So it's a flat straight line, 2,000 miles in radius. So you've got a massive area of flat, <laughs> land that you're dealing with at that know. point for it to work it must be that way therefore earth's flat this is a great flat earth proof it's also a great globe killer because it can't be done if the ground's curved because if the ground's curved where are you going to get the straight line from where are you going to get the 90 degree from you're not the answer is it can't be done on a curved surface earth can't be curved this wouldn't work has to be flat and is by the way it's functioning yeah by the by the sheer fact that the nautical almanac gives you the GP, which is the address of the star when it's at zenith over Earth, is telling you, you can relabel that book to this. It's the 90 degree book. It's a, it's a 90 degree book. The whole almanac is about 90 degrees. It's about altitude, which is 90 degrees. So when they say don't say 90, it's over for them because they're running away from the truth here. The book only tells you where that star is when it's directly overhead. It doesn't tell you where that star is at an angle. You're the one at an angle looking at it, but you need to know where it is exactly over the Earth. So the whole book is an address of stars with a perpendicular relationship to you. And what is the perpendicular? A right angle? Nobody wants to answer in case it's rhetorical. I'm going to do a shout out to Ben White at this point because it's perfectly pertinent to what you've just stated. The sextant destroys the globe religion. Thank you, Tenth Man and everyone else on this show for all your hard work. Yet another proof for Flat Earth. Add this one to the long, ever-growing list. Thank you very much indeed for the super chat, Ben White. Yeah, I mean, the, the, it, you have two zeniths going on for your first angle, right? You have your zenith as the observer, and you have the zenith of the star. 
right? Those zeniths have to be parallel to each other for this to work. Because you're making a 90 degree angle with, at, uh, with the water beneath your boat, and the almanac is making a 90 degree angle uh, with the sur surface of the earth beneath the, the uh, at the GP of the celestial body, the star or sun, whatever. So that's two 90 degree angles. So those uh, those don't work. Uh, um, I, I sent you a diagram there recently, Nathan. I had in a in a, in, a, in a video, uh, and I show we have two 90 degree angles on uh, uh, trying to put them onto a curved surface. You end up they're like swords crossing. So that doesn't work. They're not, there's not swords crossing. That line at the bottom, you're making basically a box. So you have a zenith, your zenith, which is one side of the box. You have the, the star zenith, which is the other side of the box. You have the line underneath that is meeting between the body. That's the base of the box. And then you can draw a line along the top of the box, and that will be the uh, top of the box. And then you'll have your angle from your position to where the star is. You know, and the the uh, you know, and your angle then will you can bring it up and down the side of the box, whichever. But the point is that you have two ninety degree angles that have the same baseline, the same base. So that base is not like two different bases, like swords crossing. It's one base that meet the both of them are connected to. Right. One straight. So I just, I'll unchop it. So I've just because I've got it on screen. So. What Brian's been describing is a straight line that runs from this star in this example to the ground and then a flat line running to your position. Now, if I was to add a second star at this point where it says meridian over here and say I'm going to use that as the second point to triangulate, the same principle applies. This star that I'm now inventing on this line is going to have a straight line to the ground. Now that line is going to run parallel with the line that runs from the star that's actually shown as being measured. So we've got a straight line here, and Brian described a straight line for the zenith of the gentleman in this example. And over here we draw another straight line out to the GP of this star. And all three lines, i.e. the straight line that's coming down to the ground, which is flat, meeting his position the straight line that comes down for his zenith that meets the ground, and that line that goes out to the GP of this star, flat, all are parallel. Now, if you're doing it on a curved surface, Brian describes that as some crossing like swords, they can't, don't, and are assumed not to be in order for this to work. They're all parallel. You've got streamers dangling down or plumb lines dangling down from every star that's capable of utilization for triangulation. Therefore, all of them are running parallel with one another and must be for this to work. Nathan, I got your two favorite slides in Master B that you can use to really show what you just said. S1 with line of position, is that the one you mean? Yeah, you can start with that one. Then the second one will show S1, S2, S3. But I hand it over to you. Well, this is describing exactly what I've just tried to invent with mouse drawing on things that aren't there. So each of these lines are shown and are parallel. So you'd also have one that Brian was describing as the zenith at the position where this is showing the fix. You'd have a straight line that ran parallel to the other three that are depicted in this diagram for S1, S2, and S3. So a straight, flat area. All of these circles drawn out have a radius. Why? Well, because you've got a straight line to the center from your position, and you're getting it from the GP in the almanac, where it says that star is located over the ground. So each of these circles represent a massive, potentially massive area of flat land. Must be for this to be acquired. This box represents 90 degrees. They've all got 90 degrees, although you can't see S3, because they're all parallel therefore not curving away from one another that is not possible this is a globe destroying flat earth proof yeah if it, anyone can take anyone can take a football 
right, or a basketball, and take two protractors and put them onto the basketball at two different points and see if the bases of those protractors meet in the middle exactly. They won't. They'll cross like two swords in, in, in free space. You can't have that. It's impossible. Right. The, Hold on one sorry. second. Just one second. Just one second. Just one second. Harold, Jay, did you want to add something? <laughs> no, it just scrambles to get the mute button on. No worries. So, the ballers would have to then believe that and the almanac is a book filled with curved 90 degree angles for it to I, have I, to I, work on a ball. I don't know preemptively what an anti flat earth is going to make of this. I have no idea. In the first couple of examples of people attempting to address it, they've said, well, yeah, we've got to take a straight flat measurement, but I think they're only doing that so they can assume it's flat. Uh, chocolate, you're, <laughs> it's, it's about to get worse, chocolate, because what they will do is say, we got a 90, it's at the center of the earth. There's our central angle. We take our measurements from the center, from the center of the earth. That's how we get the same corresponding angle. And then we say, oh, that's interesting. The sailor on the ship with a sextant in his hand is measuring from the center of the earth. You want me to believe that he pile of garbage? Well, the sun rays are coming in parallel, so we could assume a sphere, and we could assume parallel sunlight rays, and then we can assume that what he's doing on top could also happen from the center. Well, that's a lot of assumptions you got there. Number one, sunlight is divergent. It's not parallel, so you're gone there. Number two, the sailor's got the tool in his hand on the surface of the earth, and that's where the measurement is being documented, not no imaginary assumption that you live on a sphere, and the only place on a two-dimensional circle, by the way, that two lines can meet is at the center. But you're actually using a sextant that works on the surface of a flat plane and transposing it to a two-dimensional circle and saying, see, as long as we get the sun rays coming in parallel, as long as we assume we're on the sphere, oh, by the way, don't pay attention to the black swan. We don't need that geometric horizon. They're so gone. Now, Tank, you, you don't know about the 2021 sextant that's got a center of the earth mode. So you just flick the switch and it... <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so no angle then, right? Two straight lines no, no. for an angle? No, no. It, it also, in center of the earth mode, it changes uh, angles requiring, you know, two parallel lines, uh, uh, two perpendicular lines to curve lines. It's great. It does everything, man. It's the 2021 section. Have you, have you guys heard the rebuttal? Where they say that the globe earthers claim that because it's locally flat, they can use that flat base, and that it's only on larger scales that it curves, and then would become inconvenient for the sextant. So for so small GP, local but measurements, what about if I, say, hang on, hang on, hang on. So the GP flat. that's three thousand miles away is that local? <laughs> well, you have to find locally flat. So uh, you'd need to get an actual an actual uh, measurement of what locally flat is, or an actual amount like is it 15 miles of absolutely flat is it two miles of absolutely flat is it a thousand miles of absolutely flat you know so locally flat means nothing that means i'm pre-assuming a sphere and putting a tangent plane onto it and pretending that i can work with re in reality and still think i live on a sphere yeah using flat assuming a tangent meaning tangent to the physical geometric sphere at horizon geometric in nature straight not refracted that's the tangent bit when they say tangent plane but then oh it's okay because i've assumed first that we're on a sphere now i'm going to go forth and do everything flat because it is actually a plane i'm going to be measuring and dealing with and i'll justify it by saying no no tangent plane assumed to be on a spherical surface flat plane therefore that's all cool right oh well, no not really you're actually dealing with a flat plane then and we're showing that when you do that in terms of triangulation it's tens of thousands of square miles that's all considered flat yeah, that means it's flat. Doesn't mean that your presupposition of a tangent to the plane flat surface that you're actually going to deal with means anything. Just means that you've got a fundamentalist religious presupposition that stands before anything that you do, even if what you're going to do involves it being flat. You'll still assume it's a sphere, fundy. 
Just a quick shout out to Flat Earther, who says, It's a fact that we are one beautiful family in the centre of the universe on a non-rotating flat Earth. Thank you, Nathan Oakley, for destroying the globe zombie animal mind. And then a thanks. Thank you very much indeed, Flat Earther, for the super chat. I really do appreciate your support. Hey, I have the... Can I say something? Yeah, go ahead, Darwin. Darwin. Right, I... I'm just, I just got back. So the thing about locally flat is, is it should be asked when you say locally flat, do you mean actually flat or are you just taking it as flat? Because if you, if it's actually flat, that's going to have some geometric consequences in the whole geometry of the globe. So if it is literally locally flat, then where's the corners? All right, your, your point for me to ask people to stay tuned if they're watching on a premiere to say that if it's flat you're going to have some geometric problems to face yeah yeah i'd uh, definitely agree with that arwin but on that note i am going to say if you are watching this on either nathan oakley 1980 or nathan oakley premiering streams then stay tuned as there will be an after show to follow fortunately if you are watching this live this is where we bid you farewell a huge massive enormous thank you to all of you smash the super chat liked, commented, shared, subscribed, hit the PayPal link, joined as a Nathan Oakley 1980 channel member and all that good stuff. Once again, stay tuned if you're watching on either premiering stream. I've been Nathan Oakley and I will see you all in the next video. Yeah, that's that's how that's how they trick you because they're saying it's, <laughs> it's the center. But the point is, they can't even find their geometric horizon that they get R from. Find it? But they're I, asking us why we would expect to see it. <laughs> what do you mean, find it? <laughs> why? Why would you expect to see the thing that we told you blocks boats and buildings and shit? That gave why, us our R. Right. That the boats go R. over it. That's good enough. Why would you expect to see that, man? Come on things that we define as visible. Why do you expect to see that? I don't because you said boats and buildings were being blocked by it. That's why I would expect to see it. You told me you'd see it blocking things. That's why. <laughs> why would exactly. you expect to see it? But when you zoom in, things get back into view again, right? And that's so confusing if you still continue to believe it's a ball. Well, no, it's only confusing if you're representing the world that you think you see in Muppet Vision, where you can see the side of your own head and nothing changes in angle of size. Yeah, physical like blockage is not physical. Well, it would be if it was Earth Curve. It just isn't. We've debunked we that. The horizon's not Earth Curve. Yeah. I, I just want to say that if they're using an angle from the center of their globe, uh, out to a celestial body. They say they take it, obviously they take it on the surface of Earth, then they pray assume it's from the center of the globe. They are also, by doing that, they are making a chord, but the center of the globe, they, they, they have to treat, because to do that, you have to treat the globe as a 2D uh, circle, and then the equator, the diameter of the equator becomes a chord line. So they are still taking a straight distance that won't match their curved surface. <laughs> it's it's geometrically impossible right. and realistically impossible or like uh, like as in, as in an encompassing realistically impossible <laughs> you're just talking about the really is level <laughs> that old thing don't worry about that <laughs> yeah yeah we don't need to work at that level <laughs> no no don't worry about that Shout out to George Moser. Shout out Retracted. Is it me or are the, the trolls extra Riley today? <laughs> Seem to be so triggered.
Something must have happened. Oh, I know. Yeah, honestly, uh, I, I, I noticed that the flat earthers were extra hype on Discord earlier. I was just like, wow, Discord's hype today. <laughs> like it's, it's in the air, right? You just know it's a wrap for this nonsense. So it's like, yep. It's almost fun. I mean, it's been fun, but it's, it's just like an extra level of fun now. <laughs> Because that's what uh, I thought uh, when I heard the Black Swan and I understood it. I was just like, ooh, it, what? This is going to be fun. That was the first thing I thought. <laughs> I was just like, oh, my God. And then when they actually started retorting us with uh, refraction, uh, why would you expect to see it? We got 10 horizons. Like, what? <laughs> this is going to be more fun than I thought it was. Yo, chocolate, you should do a thing called it's a wrap. You know what I'm saying? It's a rap, but a rap. <laughs> what? It, it was. A it rap. doesn't sound as tasty. And the name of it is "It's a Rap," and the whole time you're spitting out rhymes about the black swan and the sexton. Uh, okay. I, I would call the sexton the fall of Berlin. Because it, there was no way, no road back after that. The sex tent raped them ten times over. It's a wrap. Does anybody say? Do they say that in um, in England? Like, if you want somebody to do you a favor, do they say, "Can you do me a solid"? Well, they were here. They know about England. Oh, can you oh, do so me you're, a gas? So you're familiar with that, um, that <laughs> thing? Yo, can you do me a solid? I, I am in Ireland, yeah. Hey, Adam, how's it going? Afternoon, eh? Yeah, not bad. So I stuck at work, so it's uh, probably be on mute most of it. But uh, well, welcome to Chocolate's World. <laughs> What about throwing somebody a beating? Did they ever say that? I'm gonna throw you a beating. Throw you a beating? No. Throw you a beating? Yeah. Because uh, no, one no, time this really. guy got on my nerve. No, Neil, not... you're gonna need... <laughs> See if Neil. he's got the minerals. Neil, you're gonna need R for that. Nobody <laughs> says that either. See if you've got the minerals. Really? <laughs> nah, nobody says that. That sucks. That was... Really? Yeah, somebody got on my nerves. I'm saying, yo, this guy, I'm going to throw him a beating. And this guy I was working with, like a year later, he said, yo, that time you said that, that blew me away. I never heard that before. <laughs> Are you sure it doesn't, doesn't just mean throw red beats at them? Red beating them? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that would things like that. Arwen, like, say, Arwen, uh, Arwen, look up, Arwen, look up the root word for that. Oh, good one. And there was another one where you said, nah. I'll, hit you with, I'll hit you with more combinations than a Chinese restaurant. But will it be written in Chinese? That's the question. It doesn't matter. I'll have a picture next to it. How does it know if you want to get food? technical, Ali was the, the, the first rapper. Really? Chocolate, you can just tell what food it is from the picture? <laughs> the picture doesn't always say, yeah, like, this is hot or sweet or sour or shit. You just have to guess if you That's can't read fun. it. You just buy oh. it guess. <laughs> okay. uh, if we don't start talking about flat out, Nathan is going to end the show. So someone better start talking. I'm making oh, a shit. thumbnail. So I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, before the show he's started, like, he's open for Chinese food. <laughs> before the show started, and he's like, "Wrong thumbnail." I'm like, "Well, I just used the thumbnail from the day before each day because obviously I don't know what to make as the thumbnail." So now that the show's finished, the live show that is, I've gone out looking for a, uh, well, the keywords I typed in were "sun" and "dome," and then refined that a little bit until I found a sun coming over a dome, and then the title of the show will be "the sun dome" or something like that. But you know. Anthony was like, why haven't you got a thumbnail? I was like, because oh, I don't know what the show's going to be about yet, do I? You know, until it's been made. 
Well, you could just make a photograph of your thumbnail. <laughs> hey. Okay, wow. that was kind of lame, I know. Yeah. Arwen, you're a bit cheesy today, Arwen. Dude, I had like an hour straight grilling of one singular troll in my chat today at the early bird show. I think I might have driven him to psych psychosis beyond the normal. He was so nuts. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that uh, I think that uh, the uh, that optical drop is starting to take hold out there. I think that's what's causing the ball of the bit of bother because of other people talking about it now, not just uh, the videos I made or anything the flats I made after that. Um, I have a lot of anger from uh, and stu stupidity from ballers, anti flat earthers on my channel. Uh, where I show a photograph and I squared the photograph, I put it into square mode so it could show it's definitely the center when I bring two straight lines from the two corners, from the four corners to meet each other. Um, and I show how this point in the center of the lens, where that would be in the distance uh, at the base of Blackpool would be like only a tiny bit up, you know? And instead of understanding that, they're arguing that, it, that you can't really use a photograph that may not be the actual center of the lens or that may not be the, the photographer's actual eye line, you know, this kind of stuff. It's like, you know, you can do what you want, lads, but you'll never stop angular size change from happening. You know, that's what it is. They're trying to deny that angular size change will cause the, uh, your eye line or the, the camera's center line to drop over a distance. Appear to drop, not actually, appear to drop. So they want... They can't, they can't take this, and I, and I think it's something that's permeating in, and uh, I'm getting a lot of weird, weird comments. Yeah, They're I mean, sharing I, their pain. I plugged your video um, when it came out, Brian, because I was, I was impressed. It's, it's something that I consider to be quite advanced in terms of understanding perspective, and I'll give the disclaimer now. You don't have to be explaining this stuff to them, but it's nice that you can. And it was nice back in the day, and I say it again when it was Red Pill Philosophy, Ranty Flat Earth, Myself and Life is Short on about a five-hour presentation. You know, many of the aspects of stuff that you're going through are aspects of that. And it's not easy to understand, but by the same token, when it's being hijacked, you've got to kind of explain why it's being hijacked and what the reality of what you're looking at in an image is. And you're doing that, you know, I commend you for it. It's good, you know, I couldn't have plugged your video any more than I did. I'm glad I did. Great. I hope you had a few people come over and give you comments on it. No, I appreciate that, Nathan. Uh, it, well, uh, and I have had some people subscribe. Yeah, that's, that has happened. So thank you for that. Um, but what it is, it's just, it's such a, a simple, it's such a simple concept uh, that it's hard for people to grasp. It's so simple. The ground at your feet is not your eye line. Your eye line is not the ground at your feet. So if the ground at your feet is water, and your oil line is five, six feet above the water, then your oil line is only going to be making a parallel with the horizon. It will never actually be touching the horizon. But in the distance, that space uh, between your eyes and the water, or your eyes and the ground, in the distance, due to the angular size change of everything, as you move away from it, or it moves away from you, then the, the, those, two, those two points, your oil line, and uh, the surface of the earth underneath you, those two points will appear to meet, and that will be the diffraction. That's when the diffraction limit will also come in to play. But they will just appear to meet. They won't really, as I showed with the yellow and, uh, and red line. But when the two go but over the distance, those two lines will appear to meet because everything will come down towards the, the surface in your view. That's what will happen. You will always have more view of the sky than you will of the surface. Your angle to the surface will be shallow. Your angle to the sur to the sky will be big. You know, it, it's just simple. Just two straight lines that are parallel to each other. That, yeah, Brian. An angle of size change over distance. Yeah, Brian. That's pretty simple, especially when you have clouds that are above you, say ten thousand feet above you, and then you look the way you're saying at the horizon, and those same clouds look like they're touching the Earth. Do they actually think they're no longer 10,000 feet? 
Well, that's it. You know what I mean? Uh, actually, I shout out Brian Leakey because he's been shouting me out too. And he, he made this example on Brandon's like a long while back because he understood this. He understood this ages ago. Um, it didn't have to be explained to him at all. And he, 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 like he said, well, when a cloud goes away from you, I mean, when it's three or four miles away from you, it looks like it's nearly or ten miles away. It looks like it's touching the, uh, it's touching the surface, the, the surface of the earth. But that that cloud could be several miles up. So is there several miles of drop, globe drop over, over uh, ten miles? You know what I mean? He said it's ridiculous. So it's just, it's purely just a case of everything comes down to meet the ground. You know, this thing about our perspective where the ground comes up and the, the, the sky comes down, that, that's not what happens. It's that the ground stretches wait. up in front of you. Wait, 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 wait. So are you saying that the street lights on my street, that they're not going around the surface, the curve of the earth? That's just perspective. Is yeah. that what you're saying? Damn it. Yeah, when, when they appear to come down towards the ground. <laughs> I thought my block was a spherical. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hashtag shit shrinks, right? Yep. Yeah. Otherwise, you'd hashtag... be walking in circles all day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, don't uh, live on cho you don't live on Chocolate Circle Drive? <laughs> I, I thought yeah. I used to, but I gotta change that up now. I thought I thought the street lights were setting. <laughs> just just take the horizon dip correction used by the sextant and add in angular size change over distance. So you take that same exact height of twelve foot or fifteen foot or thirty foot above the water line and you stretch it out to five miles away from you. How much of that are you going to see? Of this 30 feet above the water. If you can put a line above the water 30 feet after someone is on the deck of a ship that's the same exact height as you are, 10, 5, 10 miles away, are you going to see that person in your, are you going to perceive that, that you're looking directly into that person's eyes or is it going to look like that person is below you, your eye line? It's going to look like they're below your eye line. Yeah, but why can't we see New York from England, Brian? <laughs> well, there's many reasons for that, then. Well, angular size change would be the first one because New York is somewhere uh, in your horizon. It's within the horizon somewhere. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Isn't it you too can only far see away? as far as the horizon. <laughs> yeah, well, it's got too small, it's too far away. You're only, all, the farthest you can see is your horizon. That's it. Well, technically, it also gets blurred up. You know, because you could, if your resolution was high enough, zoom in infinitely, technically. But yeah, there will always, over the distance, be the blurring up due to the air you have to look through. And that cannot be zoomed in through, right? There will always be that limit. Well, there's one thing that you can take from that statement I said. You can grab a sextant in England, hit a star's GP that's over New York, and have that 2,500 or so miles be a straight line. That would work. And what does that prove then? There's flash all day, every day. All day, every day, and that's optics is not measurement. But the sextant shooting something high in the sky that they know the 90 degree relationship to the earth gives a perpendicular back to the person with the sextant and there's your right angle all game over i don't need to see new york right i see or the star could, over new york or you could fire a high, high powered laser perfectly horizontally that would probably also prove it and cause a world war but i got a high power light directly over new york all i have to do is get the angular relationship to a right angle to it that's it just the hypotenuse. Okay. And technically, a radio signal is also considered light, so there's already the proof that it can reach very, very far. And Discord have a problem with anything we're saying. Feel free to speak up. Yeah, and while you're at it, tell me how light bounces off the ionosphere. 
according to you, which is what radio is. I don't know what now. How does that work? Ionis. What? Ionis. Yes. Get it approved. Sure. <laughs> well, right. I mean, to keep it on what Tent is saying, the scene is that I live in New York and I like his example. Yeah, uh, you guys will never speak up. You're cowards. I don't even know what you are, to be honest, but I know that you're not going to speak up. You haven't all. You haven't already spoken up. Don't think you will. You'll blame it on some reason or another. I don't care. Nobody's going to speak up to tell Tent he's wrong. That's all that matters. Eli, it's like it's like in the playground when someone f said something about your mama. Of course, you know, we all know the mama jokes. But you would step up and defend your mama if someone did that. Now, the globe, we have a globe joke just like the mama joke. And no one's stepping up to protect their globe mama. I wonder why. <laughs> I was the guy that wishes someone would say something about my mama. <laughs> that's why, that's why I'm calling sometimes, you out. Sometimes they'll defend it, and other times they'll just grieve. In private. Sometimes it's, kind of, it's almost like the same thing. When they're defending it, it's almost like that's their grieving. <laughs> but seriously, though, I still want to know how light can reflect off a layer, let's just call it a layer in this case, of ionized gas or whatever, and literally bounce off it like a mirror, which is kind of the suggestion when ballers say that radio goes around the world because it bounces off the ionosphere. So can you show me light or radio bounce off something ionized like it is a mirror? Yeah, let me just say, you're going to need R for that, Arwin. So when you say ionosphere... No. That's why I said ion layer in this particular case. The ion layer? What the heck is an ionosphere? Well, that's ion what they say is out there. A layer of ions, ionized air, that's supposed to be able to bounce off radio signals. When, when oh, Loran, the shaped air again? When Loran first came out, uh, the Allies used it to spot the enemy ships, and they were based off of New York, pointing towards England, uh, and of course many other places. But my reading is a few years ago. During the daytime, they had 750 mile range. During the nighttime, it went over 1500 mile range, and that's a direct line of sight over the water. So they weren't bouncing anything with the Loran. Oh, it can still work with terrestrial refraction. Light goes in circles or something. You're going to need R for that as well. Sorry. Light going around in circles is an assumption of atmospheric refraction based on an R value. <laughs> we got to have R, boss. What do you mean you got to have R? You don't have to have anything. <laughs> what are you talking about? Got to have R. Can we just presuppose? You can do whatever you want. Well, we don't have to work at the really is level, so we, we were given full permission from Georgie Musa. That's right. You, yeah, you don't have to. Here. Yes. Yeah. Why don't we presuppose here? Yes, that's right. You don't have to work at the really is level. You, not me, you. What are we going to do now, courageous? I don't know, minute. I'll find my gun, find the gun. <laughs> okay, but that still doesn't <laughs> answer the question how light is supposed to be bouncing off some ion layer. Like, how does that work? Is there is that just completely made out up out of no, nothing, or is there actually some kind of test? No, Arwen. Behind um, no, Arwen. You can't um, bounce anything off of air like a mirror. No, you can't do that. Not even when it's ionized. No. So, what, what does ionized sure? mean? Isn't it? Isn't it? Isn't it more? Um, I don't. I don't even know. Ionized. No, it's more ionized. 
Can I get a, like a sample of this ionized guy? Uh, well, you can actually Plasma. actively ionize things with machines. Pretty All sure. right, show me, a, show me, a, show me a picture of my my face after putting an ionized circle of uh, of gas in front of me. Pretty sure Alex Jones sells ionized gas, doesn't he? Sorry. Is that not something on sale from Alex Jones shop? What? No. But you, you have <laughs> like air, no. But ionizers are pretty standard fare in modern uh, air filters. Yeah, our air filtration systems have ionizers because it's pretty good. It helps against the dust specifically. It ionizes the dust, which makes it fall down to the ground and not float around so much. I was actually mistaken. Sorry, I looked at it. But it was actually horny goat reed. Sorry, easy to get those two confused. <laughs> Well, it just goes to show what's on your mind again. Can, can I bring things back uh, back on track a little bit? You know the claim of you move away from Polaris, and for every 69 statue at Moyers, it drops by one degree. Now, I don't disagree with this claim, because that is the exact uh, calculation that you use or uh, to create a measurement for the GP of every star. So... If I see a star at 75, uh, at 70, an angle of 75 degrees, I know that's 25 by 69 statute miles uh, distance to that star's GP from me to from from me as the observer to the GP in a straight line. So, what's really funny is that the baseline for the baseline for for that started with Polaris. Baseline for that distance measurement or distance calculation, I should say, started with Polaris. It's like they found that, well, Polaris drops by this amount for every, uh, for when we move this distance away from it, right? Um, and that's how they, they figured, and then they, they figured out the other stars were doing the same thing, right? But what's really interesting is that all the stars, including Polaris, right, uh, when you're making a, when you make an angle from them or they make an angle from you if you make an angle from Polaris or, uh, or a star makes an angle from you you your distance to the GP of that celestial body will always be in straight line 69 miles per degree straight 69 statute miles or 60 nautical miles per degree so they always want to argue with us about Polaris but they never, ever, ever want to mention the other stars if for, within the same argument. Because Polaris suits their, they, suits their claim that they're going back down over a ball. Now, I don't think it does suit it at all. I, I've yet to see it being done. They just keep claiming it. But I, I, no matter how many times I ask for them to show and prove their, point, their claim, um, it just mathematically, like just on paper, I've never seen it. Now, I'm not saying it can't be done, but I have never seen it. Why did they withhold it? But the point I'm making is, if all the other stars if you are doing the same thing, um, that causes them a problem. How come they never brought that? Because that would mess with, like, although their globe is rotating, um, it still wouldn't work out the same way as with Polaris. Because it wouldn't work out with the rotation because of different places on the Earth. It wouldn't work out the same way as it does for a for the whole claim of you move away from Polaris and it drops by one degree every 60 million statute miles. That it wouldn't work out for their rotation from different points on their globe for all the other stars to do the same as Polaris. But I don't think it would anyway. I don't, if I'm just, this is just speculation, but I don't think that would work out. And they never mention it. They only ever talk about Polaris, but they never mention that the exact same thing happened with the, same, with the other stars. The exact same calculation is used with the other stars. For a distance, and it's all angular, right? So it has to be flat. That's another thing they want, they want to whitewash over. But why did they never address that? Why did they never address that? It's always, oh, you move away from Polaris, it, dro it drops by uh, one degree every 69 miles, that equals globe. I don't even know how that equals globe, but that's what they claim. Well, that, Adam went through it yesterday. So you put the protractor in the middle of the sphere and then say each degree that you're talking about is how much it drops as you move around a sphere. Now, he all, Adam also explained how when you back-engineer that into a globe based on the actual measurement that you're taking, it doesn't work. But just by 
pure fiat. They're just saying because it's degrees, it's a sphere. And then you don't have to even mention that it's measured from the centre out and those are the degrees that they're referring to. As opposed to taking a degree measurement based on a flat plane and an angle with a sextant to it as you move back every um, 69 miles. So that's the angle that you're talking about when you talk about the degree drop, right? The degree that you'd see it drop in your sextant. But they just, like I say, assume at that point. That's why we covered it for about an hour. Talking of covering things, um, Brian, I don't know if you noticed because... Because I put it out as a shorts video. In other words, if you get it square or less phone format, you can put it out as an actual shorts and the algorithm recognises it as such if it's in that format. Therefore, it doesn't necessarily reach the same audience. It's punted out to different people. But I took of the discussion with Virus, which was your discussion, Brian, um, that developed into an hour-long conversation. More than an hour, in fact. Probably more like an hour and a half. Um, I made some minor edits to it and that'll come out tonight. Although when you're hearing this recorded, it'll be yesterday or the day before. But for us now, it'll be tonight. But in the meantime, already I've put out a video that was, this is the point what I'm telling you, that was just you. So as I was scanning through the whole hour and a half, I wanted to find a minute long summary of what was being claimed. And it ended up, obviously, as it's your point, being you. Um, and albeit with a few edits of ums and ahs being taken out, it was a beautifully concise summary of mass versus gas. Um, so that's been put out as a short video. I just didn't know, you know if you'd known or recognised that because it's come out as a short. So if you check it out, I've, I've put it at the top of the Nathan Oakley 1980 channel in Flat Earth Thoughts 1980. It's just a playlist that comes up when you go to the channel. Um, but you'll see it. It's just called Mass vs. Gas. And it's it's all you. I don't know if you want to mirror it or nick it or something. But I just thought you'd at the very least like to know that it's literally 100% <laughs> Brian's logic. Actually, yeah, I look, I look, I listen to that. I, I, I check it out for that after the show. That's what I will. Thanks. So, yeah, I'd like to hear that. Yeah, Nathan, not, not, I want to know. Not out of self, self, um... Nathan, Sorry. I want to know if Brian is mass or gas, or is a virus mass or gas in this mass versus gas? Well, mass versus gas is both positions being put forth by um, virus because he needs it to have mass, the gas, that is. And Brian's pointing out how it isn't. Now, in that hour and a half, that that gets repositioned twice minimum to be made Brian's point, which got him very pissed off. And I, by the end, I was agreeing with him and going, look, you know, he's cutting you off because you're making this assertion about it having mass Brian's, which it isn't. You know, utilising the phase change to claim that as it gains mass, when it's still a gas, somehow that's going to make it go down, go boom, boom, like a liquid. Now, Brian's pulling that apart left, right and centre with all sorts of other obfuscations, the usual stuff. Um, but that's uh -huh. going to come out tonight. Like I say, I'll give it the title just in case anyone wants to look up the video that we're discussing. It's called Mass Atmospheric Inertial Gas Virus! Exclamation mark, exclamation mark. Good title, don't you think? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm looking forward to listening back to that show. But it's slightly but it's edited. Good to know. I actually listened to it again before I came on this morning. It was, it was freaking good, man. Yeah, well, that, that, like me, that's the criteria I apply, actually, chocolate. So if I find myself listening to a show again, so it was published last night on my second channel, but I came back to it this morning and found myself listening to it again. I'm like, if I'm coming back to this and listening to it again, it's worth editing out and republishing with, with minor edits and an intro and outro, et cetera, et cetera. So I've done that. You know, It actually took me all morning because it was long. So I say minor edits. It still took me a long time. Um, but yeah, I'll republish yeah. that under the title Mass Atmospheric Inertial Gas Virus. Yeah, I just like this, <laughs> just like this to throw out there that the actual question is, and the only question, like after that whole show, the only question that we need to ask on, on the subject is does gas exhibit inertia? That's where that argument should start, if you know what I mean. Does gas exhibit inertia? If you're going to go at it from that angle, and you can start from there. Or how are they going to prove it those? <laughs> or you oh, could start know. out by asking, do all states of matter does do all things have mass? And then the answer would be no. What's because mass? Because mass is mass is an extracted element and it, it it's it demands a very specific setup. Right? It's not universal. It's not like, oh, everything you're going to point at has a mass. That's just not true because you can't apply the calculation, the measurement in order to establish the mass effectively with anything you're going to point at. Do you want to, do you want to ask me your uh, question I, I, again, I'm... Chocolate? See if Arwen answers this time. 
What's mass? It's a derived concept that coincides with the, well, the convention of weight, uh, which is also utilized in the modeling of the gravitational system, which is a concept and it's not proven, right? So it, it, uh, it lockstep works towards that, but it's still just a convention. It's not universal. It's always based on weighing it. I'll tell you what, Matt. It didn't sound like a definition to me. Hold on. Oh, yeah, I was going to say that didn't I, sound I, like I, a... Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. No, no, so, was, ah, hello. Was, yes, I agree. No yeah, 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 hello. Hello. Yeah, I agree. He's not going to get no. a citation for that, but Brian's trying to get in with a definition. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, yeah. Mass is a description. That's it. Description That's of what? what? Of what? Inertia. Or mole. And inertia is a description of... Resistance to acceleration? Yeah. Oh, I got it right. So... Ding! Uh, Wait, serious? Uh, so, so I, I, I mass is the resistance the to acceleration? I, yeah, but hold on. Said mass attracts mass, so the resistance yeah. to acceleration attracts the resistance to acceleration. No, a Wait. description attracts a description, uh, Chalkers. Yeah, I was going to say that first. Hold on, hold on. Chocolate just pulled apart Cavendish and inserted this logic with inertia being mass as definition, or the definition of mass being inertia, I should say. So he's saying, if that's the case, and mass is defined as inertia, then Cavendish hypothesis, which is formally, if mass, then mass attracts mass, then it becomes... Go ahead, Chocolate. The resistance to acceleration is attracted to the resistance of acceleration. Yeah, well, load of old nonsense, eh? But that's what Cavendish's hypothesis becomes. Okay, that I would interpret just that. Just saying as... that is funny, Cavendish hypothesis. <laughs> so, so you're saying that a slow, the the slowing down of a body attracts another body that's also slowing down. Yes. That's interesting. Uh, I I just want to say I want to say something to Nathan in a moment, uh, Nathan. So uh, remind me of this or something I have to say to you. And I want to state to Arwen that I understand why you asked the question you did and the way you asked it, but just asking does gas exhibit inertia is directly referencing their claim that gas has mass. Like so that's true. That's not technically act like gas. true, but the problem is that in their mind, they misunderstand mass. They don't really misunderstand an inertia, right? Because that's really a mechanical thing that they can point at. Mass, however, is a lot more confusing because it's been applied in so many different ways, different models, the same word. And that's why it kind of slips right through. So, Sounds like you don't have a coherent definition for it. Hmm. Well, that's what the incoherent theory is for. They also have it as an equivocation fallacy because they have it defined as inertia and defined as mole. What did you want to bring up, Brian? You said you got a point that you wanted to bring up in the moment or something. Yeah. Sorry, one second. One second. Uh, do, yeah, just, do, just before, just oh, before it's lost. Just, yeah. When Adam and you were stating about what Adam was saying about them taking an angle to the surface of the Earth from the center of the globe, for the Polaris uh, uh, dropping by one degree every 69 miles thing. Their claim, right? See, by saying that, you're kind of, and I don't mean this in a bad way towards uh, uh, Adam, but you're kind of facilitating their claim. Their claim is not an angle from the center of the globe, right? They might state that as their claim, but their actual claim is that they travel down along a curved surface. That is their actual claim. And that creates one degree of drop per 69 statute miles. No, I That's get that. Claim. No, I get that. Adam's just expl Adam was explaining it by way of apologetics for their position. Say that by pure fiat, as soon as you say degrees, that means that they're going to assume that you're moving around that curved surface that you're describing. And I know what you're actually saying is, no, they're moving away on a curved surface to get the one degree every 69 miles. That's the reality of what they do. I appreciate that also. But Adam's point was to say that when this comes up and you start describing it as actually Mitchell from Australia did and said, look, it's one degree every 69 miles. That's a linear relationship. You go, yeah, 
but as soon as they say degree, that's the fork in the road that they're going to start talking about how it relates to the centre of a presupposed spherical Earth, the degree being how it changes as you move around on a spherical surface. That's all he was saying. He's not saying that you're giving it to them, that's him describing what they will do, as opposed to giving it them. Uh, no, I understand that, but you see, the reason they go to the centre of the globe is because their claim of a curved surface, then moving down and away from Polaris on a curved surface, gives them that one degree per 69 mile drop. Yeah, but it doesn't. I wouldn't. Yeah, but I wouldn't. Yeah, but see, this is the thing. I wouldn't even talk, uh, even talk about the centre of uh, the globe. It's like your claim is that the Earth has a curved surface to it that curves at eight inches per mile squared, and that as you move away from Polaris, going south, then that then the Polaris will drop in the sky for every sixty-nine miles of distance that you cover. That is a claim, and that is what they have to support. Because as soon as you it's like I don't even allow any or any or pre assumption or any anything like that. Support that claim. You're claiming you're doing this thing on the surface. I don't care about what you want to believe about your R value. You're claiming you're doing this on the surface. You're claiming this happens. This is a visual thing that happens due to you moving away, uh, uh, 69 every uh, moving away from Polaris and it's dropping one degree every 69 miles as you move down along a curved surface that's curving at eight inches per mile square. It's like so. Where is this eight inches per mile square curved surface? Let's start there. It isn't. They can't. Yeah, it doesn't it, function that yeah. way. It can't work yeah. because as soon as you introduce that, you no longer have the linear relationship. Now, they don't have that. It doesn't calculate or back calculate into a sphere. And like I say, when they say degrees and just assume it, it's not that it means it works mathematically either. Because when you're saying one degree, you mean the measured angle. Well, how do you first and foremost get that measured angle of one degree drop if you've got a squared function in terms of your path that you're walking backwards along? Well, you don't, do you? It just fails on its ass, doesn't it, Brian? Yeah, exactly. And, and the, the, some of the reason why I, I'm stating this is that we have contradiction within this claim as well, because Adam, Adam has spoke about how they can use the centre of the globe, uh, and they, they can, yeah, you can take an angle that way, absolutely. You're just using it as a protractor, right? Using the, the equator line as a protractor in the, uh, of their globe. But I have comments from fundies, right, stating that or has nothing to do with the calculation. No, it doesn't, because it's being measured on the surface. The angle that's being referred to is actually the angle of measurement, right? Yeah. Not the angle Definitely. that you move around in degrees when you turn on a presupposed spherical surface with the centre point being the degrees that are being referenced, because they aren't. But what I'm saying is, and Adam was pointing this out, just by mention of degrees... They'll take it to be from the centre of a presupposed spherical Earth, even though that, as you point out from someone who's realised how they're actually acquiring this measurement to make the assertion, isn't how it's done. But they'll just take it to mean spherical as soon as the word degrees are mentioned. That's all that Adam was harping on about. Yeah, I'm just saying that, like, that there is this, we, and just for the future, we have a contradiction. Two con it's, it's like the hump drop thing. We have a contradictory, two contradictory arguments going on. Whereas... Adam is speaking about what the real argument, which would be from the centre of the globe. But there's, uh, these other people, and some of these fundies are not like uneducated. They're not absolute idiots. They're idiots, but they're not absolute idiots. And the, some of the more educated ones have actually stated to me that the, the angles to Polaris uh, have, uh, uh, on a globe earth have nothing to do with R or C. Well, that's just. Sorry, on. Oh, oh, hold on, hold on, yeah. hold on. On a globe yeah. Earth, it has everything to do with R and C. What are they talking about? Exactly. Yeah, but this is it. This, this is the, this is the thing. It's, they're they're literally handing over their whole claim and stating it's just an angle off a flat surface. So but you might as well. I, I, uh, hold on, uh, hold on. At that point, did you say welcome to flat Earth? Yeah, I said well, but I didn't know uh, like what, what what kind of response do I give to that? It's not to argue about. That's this this measurement, right if, if they're going to say, to well, yeah, it's welcome to flat earth. If they're going to say it's got nothing to do with R, well, you're like, so you're saying it's got nothing to do with the curved surface that you're assuming. Well, then, if it's got nothing to do with the curved surface and it's an angle measurement that shows a linear relationship, that all points towards flat earth. If it's got nothing to do with R or C, it's got nothing to do with the globe. Welcome to flat earth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but this is this is... 
this is what's going on out there. They, 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 this is the, they're back to them pre-assuming that they can take local horizontals and do angles to Polaris off it. <laughs> We well, can't do that either. What do you mean local horizontal? <laughs> oh, hold on, hold on. So this is them assuming that you can do it on a flat surface to get the me measured angle. Well, then they're not doing it on a curved surface. Welcome to flat Earth again. Yeah. But, you know, these Smashing are the different the arguments that are going on. <laughs> Come on, sorry, Chocolate. Ah, welcome to flat Earth. Snacks in the back. Athens to the left. DJ's, DJ's spinning requests. Smoke them if you got them. Right. It's like the limey play guy explaining that when he does the actual measurement to do the triangulation, you've got to have a flat surface. And then disclaiming afterwards, I think it's only done that way so you can assume it's flat. It's like, yeah, that's right. That's your rebuttal. Welcome to Flat Earth. <laughs> yeah, I think, I, I think what Brian is expressing is exactly that because it's obviously welcome to flat earth when they do this just like andrew thomas young saying all his refraction studies were done over a plain earth but then he had to change it to match geometric considerations for his globe model so the point that that brian is at with these people is if i may brian how do i get the smart guy who's saying a dumb thing to understand whereas uh, nathan and chocolate are saying all you gotta do is say welcome to flat earth well, yeah, th well, this they, one. they're the ones saying it, basically. You just got to yeah. kind of reiterate it. Yeah, that's, 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 what Brian, that's Brian's point. That's they're the ones saying it. it out. Sorry. They're admitting it by saying it's got nothing to do with that. They're admitting it. Well, this, yep. is, why, this is why I want to keep the argument on the surface, because on the surface is their claim, and on the surface of Earth, they have to pre-assume a flat plane to take... Uh, an angle. You have yeah, but, to. But, and all you can do then is pre assume a second different horizontal. So they're back to violating zero degrees horizontal again. Yeah, that's so true. Back to the airplane argument. I don't think the dip correction is that important, is it? It's very important. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really joking. <laughs> but, but you know, the ballers. Can I? Please. The ballers yeah, only re the ballers really never have any option, you know, because every time they try to prove the spherical geometry, they always end up being forced by reality itself to first adapt their spherical assumptions about Earth to the actual measurable physical flat reality. Because otherwise it, it just won't match anything. The results will never yield anything cohesive. And then afterward, after they succeeded adapting their sphere assuming model to the actual flat earth, only after that can they kind of like move around with it and kind of hide that they originally based everything they did on that flat surface. Because that's how it all works. The reality yeah. is it is flat. So whatever you want it to be, you always have to start out with flat. Yeah, tangent plane. Yeah. Well, tangent plane, right? Who, who can explain a tangent plane briefly, quickly? I can. It's a, it's a tangent plane. It's a straight line. It's placed on uh, the outside of a circle. And it touches at one point, And it pre-assumes that that whole area of that circle is flat and horizontal. So it's a flat surface balanced tippy toed on one point of a spherical surface. So tangent, tangent for a sphere, plane, bit they're actually dealing with the measuring flat surface. Yep. Welcome to just, flat earth. Just saying tangent is presupposing a sphere. The transition I can't get unless away it's from a curve it. tangent according to Rumpus. Can I oh, can I uh, bring in a, a, a bit of sales in, in this, Nathan? Um, depends what you're selling. <laughs> no, just the art of sales. Okay, when you're in sales, body language, the questions you ask of the potential customer, is, is very important because you're also assessing, is this customer capable of buying my product? From the other side, uh, the customer is saying, do I really trust the salesperson and is, this, is his product something I need? So you got two different viewpoints. I, I, I want to attach that to Brian talking to a baller, if I may, just for a second. So we explain 
they get to a point of, oh my gosh, if I say this, I sound stupid, but they go ahead and say it. And we heard virus and others do this many times on the show. They'll say something stupid. Um, they're at zombie mode at this point. There is no reaching them because they're fighting language. They're fighting context. They're saying, I don't want your product. I'm a baller. I'm in the zombie mode as a baller. I'm not in the open mode as a baller where I would listen to your arguments and see if any of it refute my zombie baller mode. So this is disengagement time. This is like, welcome to flat earth. You're not making any sense. Goodbye. I don't right. want to talk to those people at that point. I could only have conversation if there's a mutual interest of finding the truth. And there isn't with the ballers, anti-flat earthers in most cases, because they don't want to buy the product. They never did. They come here with an argument against our product. And then when we destroy their product and their argument, they, they still stay in that mode, even after the whole audience says, we're all laughing at you for saying uh, this. What's oh, well, Actually, we did this yesterday in the after after show. We were going through some of the funny statements that the ballers have said to us. The air is not the atmosphere, or and then there was something like, I could be in my pants and get out of my pants and keep the same reference frame. I mean, it's just nonsense at this point. Right, they come into the store, they basically say, oh, look, we got some arguments here for barter. Then the salesman, the, the flat earther says, yeah, sorry, we don't take that. We don't allow that, that's not legal tender. So then they decide, oh, okay, then we're going to rob you. Give me all your globes right now. I said, we, we don't have any globes. And then they try to look around everywhere through the cash, cash registry, through the, the cabins. And yeah, there is no globes. So they just go away well, very frustrated. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'll give you a synonym for that illustration or, or, or side by side. Uh, curved is straight. Straight is curved. Um, angles angles don't have to come and meet at a corner with two straight lines creating a vertex. No, no, no. They'll deny reality. That's how far they're gone and why you shouldn't be still there talking to them trying to sell your product because they've just checked out. Yeah, I, I think what Kent is saying is there's no point in trying to sell a helicopter to a block layer. They're not going to be able to buy it. You know, yeah, so, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, like, I mean, there's no point. Like, I, I didn't bother when I, when I saw... Um, uh, that the calculation had nothing to do with R or C. At that point, like I just said, well, there was nothing to argue about. <laughs> do you know what I mean? I, I kind of just <laughs> laugh because I feel like, well, I'm not selling anything. I'm talking about what you observe and experience every day, and you think I'm selling sun, but you believe it's something else. So for me, that's the point where I just find it funny because I love when people say, oh, just prove it's flat. I just look around. Prove it's not. <laughs> what are you yeah. talking about? <laughs> are you all right? Where Where is the ball part of this ball that you think we live on? Where's that? Well, that yeah, was making the ball the Hold on, hold on, hold on. Head. Thank you, Alvin. Yeah, who Who's making the positive <laughs> claim here? They are. Globus. Yeah, they're claiming we live, we live on a curved surface. We don't see any curve. We don't see any rotate. We don't experience any movement. We don't experience any curvature. So it's their business. So when they say prove flat earth, no. Flat earth is what we experience. Stationary earth is what we experience. You prove your claim. That's what I said to the propane driver the other day after I pointed to the water tanks and the sky. I said, are, are we spinning according to their model? We're supposed to be spinning. Do you, do you sense the earth spinning right now? He says, no. I said, okay, then why are we even thinking to believe their lies that we're rotating at 15 degrees an hour. It's a, isn't it obvious that the sun is moving at 15 degrees an hour? He goes, yeah. Well, those yeah, pesky if, senses, don't worry about those. Even on that example of, uh, or on that argument of uh, uh, rotation, where they so, try and claim, right, and this is, this is really, really, really scummy, right, what they do. And I, like, I, I mean that, it's really scummy and low behavior intellectually. Because what they'll do is they'll claim that we are uh, rotating, uh, but because it's a constant that we don't notice it, right? Now, they'll then try and use the example of constant movement in an airplane or constant movement on a train. Yeah, and then say, you see, you wouldn't notice it like that. It's like, no, 
we do notice it. I always notice when I'm moving in an airplane or a train. I know I'm moving. I know always know when I'm moving. That's a lot of rubbish, right? But there's a greater thing than that. Their globe, their globe's path, twelve month path around the, their heliocentric sun, is a constantly changing acceleration. It's constantly accelerating and decelerating. So it accelerates yep. for six months and it decelerates for six months, right? So that is a constant change. So this thing about us supposedly on the globe having a constant movement is a complete lie. And they know it. In an elliptical orbit too, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So the, the, yeah, so there's, there's two ends of that that aren't, exa- that aren't circular. You know, so it's like the whole thing, the whole thing is like, the whole thing is they're claiming a constant motion. I still hear rumpus and all them doing it. I, I, it's a constant motion. It's a constant motion. And they know, because I've corrected them. They know. I've, maybe not all of them, but I've corrected rumpus. I've corrected a, a load of them. It's like, no, that's not true. The earth, uh, the globe earth, uh, as per Kepler's solar annelina, is, making it, is constantly changing all the time, not just daily. From minute to minute, it's changing its acceleration uh, amount. And all they, all they came back to me, one person did some calculations and came back. Well, it, it, it is changing, but you wouldn't notice it that much. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Oh, so ne- the, the negligible you know, argument. Oh, yeah, it's, hap- it's definitely happening, but you just can't notice it. It's, it's too small. It's ne- negligible. Well, <laughs> well he, could, he was admitting that there was something to notice there, though. Do you know what I'm saying? That's what I pulled them on. So you're admitting there's something. I said you would notice that, and you're admitting that there's something to notice. So they'll just throw a calculation at someone, and they'll tell the person that they wouldn't notice it, right? They're making they're making that person's mind up for them. That's the cheek, the neck of these people. It's like okay. they, they'll tell you that you wouldn't notice it. Well, what, right. Well, that spans well, they make a claim like... and then they scale it up or down until it becomes practically out of reach in order to deter you from further investigation. No, exactly. Yeah, no, no, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. So, in this particular example, that's a utilization of the non-inertial reference frame. So, the reason it's claimed to be non-inertial is because you're not going to notice the inertia from that reference frame. You're part of it. So, when they say you wouldn't notice, you go, okay. That's on the basis that I accept that we're on a non-inertial rotating reference frame. I don't notice the inertia. I'm part of it. But what I would notice is the deflection in things that aren't on that rotating reference frame. That would be Coriolis deflection. The not actual deflection of things that aren't attached to the rotating reference frame that you don't notice because it's non-inertial. So you would notice Coriolis effect, things drifting, but we don't. So it's like, okay, yeah, I'll give you that we won't notice the Earth turning beneath my feet because it's a non-inertial turning reference frame. But that means anything that's in the inertial reference frame, i.e. not turning with Earth, would have a deflection to the tune of 15 degrees an hour. And we don't see that. So there's no effect to observe to claim that we're on a non-inertial reference frame. We're not. Now, number one, we'd notice, and therefore it wouldn't be capable of being described as non-inertial because you'd notice the bloody inertia. Also, if we're going to claim that we don't notice because it is non-inertial, then there's going to be an effect to observe that would be drift called Coriolis. So, do you mean uh, that I'm, do you mean I'm, that I can't I can't change pants while remaining in the same pants and not notice it? <laughs> oh man, that was a neat little magic trick I was going to show my wife. Sorry. Reference frames aren't like underpants. Taking them off and slinging them over your shoulder doesn't mean you take the reference frame with you. <laughs> Nathan, <laughs> the, the pants the, are the reference frame. The 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 analema, the the path of the globe out around the sun is a constantly changing acceleration. From moment to moment, it's constantly changing. We are in their model at at present constantly accelerating until early uh, i think it's uh, early early january and then in their model we'll be constantly decelerating uh, until early july that is their claim and they're telling I... you that you wouldn't well, know any but... of these things well no because the the detail that you're the movement of the light that you're describing is an effect that you're describing based on you being turning underneath non-inertial turning reference frame 
So the apparent deviation of the light is effectively the Coriolis deviation that you're describing. It's not the effect of that light taking that path that you're detailing, is it? It's claimed to be you turning beneath it. So it's the non-inertial reference frame causing that apparent movement of the light again, isn't it? Well, that means that that would tick the box of we're seeing an apparent movement because we're turning beneath stuff. Okay, but that means that we must see 15 degrees an hour drift from anything that's in the inertial reference frame. There's no exceptions, but nothing else exhibits the effect. So again, if you're going to start detailing not actual deflection in lights, they're apparent movements, that's the assumption that you're on a non-inertial turning reference frame and you're exhibiting this effect in the inertial and that's the light and movement thereof that you're describing, Brian. No, no, I'm not speaking about the... I'm not speaking about the visual. I'm speaking about the, the physical movement. It's not physical um, movement. Hold on. The um, analema um, is um, not um, a physical um, movement. It's not claimed to be that path. That's just the apparent movement that you observe, isn't it? Yeah, I, I'm only attacking their claim because what they try to do is that when you... Uh, when someone says to them, but I don't feel myself rotating, they say, oh, that's because it's a, a constant... Mo movement in the same direction and that's why you don't notice it because it's so constant and my what I hate when I hear that is because I know that they're lying that in their model the analema states that the globe earth is not at a constant rate the rotation might be claimed to be constant but their orbit of the sun the offset elliptical orbit is not constant it's six months of acceleration and six months of deceleration and it's a constant change in acceleration. So their claim is that you won't feel this, uh, you won't feel the acceleration of the earth rotating uh, on, uh, while you're on it because it's a constant acceleration that holds the same, the same rate, right? But what they're not bringing in and they're hiding and they don't bring in at that point is, but their analema is not a constant rate. It's a constantly changing rate, which is the opposite from their claim of a constant motion. So they're claiming you don't feel, they're claiming, like, I'm not for us, but they're claiming to someone who doesn't know any better. You don't feel the motion of the rotation of the Earth because it's a constant. But they never mention the, the constantly changing orbit around the sun, which is a constantly changing acceleration and deceleration. That's my argument. It's not about the visual thing, the Coriolis. It's that they are claiming something and they're leaving out a very, very important part, the whole essence of their model, which is Kepler's analemia which takes their claim of a constant motion and, tr and flushes it down the toilet because it's anything but constant. It's, a, right. it's constantly not constant. No, I agree. And somebody who likes to bang that drum also is the guy who you're probably familiar with from comments called Ute Hube, who talks about the exact same thing you've just detailed. The speed changes yeah. would absolutely give you a noticeable effect to observe. Yeah, I, I, I've heard the thing you talk about. Yeah, yeah speed changes, yeah. It's a constant speed change, constant rate, rate change. Yeah. I just I, want to tell I just want to tell Eli the the time that virus said he came out of his pants and put it on his shoulders and and he hasn't left the reference frame. That argument has no legs to stand on. Uh, uh. <laughs> I still made offer for it. Something else as well. This is something I've looked at right recently, and this could be—I don't—I could be wrong about this. So I'm throwing it out there as speculation because I could be wrong, and some global might uh, might correct me on it mathematically. But solar noon on the 21st of June is four minutes different than solar noon on the 21st of December. Now, in in their analema, right, because Kepler has to explain the apparent changing of rate of, in motion of the sun, he, they, they, he had to make the, the globe earth go around the sun faster when it's closer to it and slower when it's further away, right? So that makes up for the apparent speed change or rate change we see of the sun, because the sun does have an apparent that can be shown um, and it's officially uh, admitted apparent rate change where it moves faster through the sky in the southern summer than it does in the northern summer. Slower in the northern summer, faster in the southern summer. This is a, an officially thing, officially accepted thing, not some made up flat earth or thing. You can ask NASA, right? They will admit it. But 
the problem is is that the solar noon that has nothing to do with that part of the claim because solar noon is based on a 15 degree an hour rotation so how can you have solar noon at two different times of the year be different how can you have that how can you have solar noon on the 21st of june be four minutes different than on the 21st of December. Now, I'd say, I'd say it's probably more. I'd say that four minutes is possibly more to do with, uh, uh, possibly more to do with uh, globe mathematics, but they still have to have a four minute change. How does the globe out change its rate? Because solar noon on the globe out, is it, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but is that not connected directly to their 15 degrees an hour rotation of the globe? How can it be four minutes different? Does the, does the globe speed down? Or, sorry, speed down. Sorry, that's totally stupid. Uh, slow down and speed up? It is very minutes. odd, yes. Like, why in one day cycle does the is the angular speed of the sun increased? It's not like, oh, it's increasing, it's going down again. No, it's just constant. But on a new day, the angular effective angular speed is different than another day because of the total path it moves, yet it still moves at a constant rate when it comes up. It's a very weird thing. Agreed. I think 10th is wrong. Yeah, the reference frame trousers argument seems okay to me. Right. Well, as long as you're begging the question of an axis, they're usually happy. 10th is never wrong. Even when he's wrong. I get it, seems. Ben obviously isn't there. He's run away to get tea. Like Tony Montana. I always tell the truth, even when I lie. To answer you, Brian, because it's been left out there hanging long enough. You, you can't, right? can't suddenly be three minutes off that would imply a massive speed change well there's four your four december is four minutes faster and june is four minutes slower so how can you have that on the globe i i heard something about trousers well maybe the earth is expanding and contracting in order for that to become possible <laughs> well, that know. explains why their horizons moving back and forth all over the place, guys. The Earth is breathing. It's a nice yeah. breathing big ball. Woohoo! <laughs> it's Earth the wobbly, thing? wobbly Earth. Earth. The wobbly, Earth. wobbly Earth. Are we in 2018? Yeah, Nathan. Do I, do I need to hem you all in? <laughs> <laughs> what is there? Okay. I thought. Oh, I thought. I thought for a minute you said I was slacking off. Nice. Oh, slack! <laughs> oh dear. Yeah, it was much more fun when we were talking about cord droids. Oh. Yeah. Wow, the comedic timing. That was great. You took the leg out more than each with that one, thanks. That that was great, Nathan. You have me. Yeah, now we know who has to. Sorry. Happy and stitches. <laughs> you didn't get my one, thanks. No, I'm sorry. I was. It's because the joke yeah, wasn't tailored to you. Oh. I didn't. Oh, good one, <laughs> now we know where, where's the pants in the family. We're not going to get through all these well, puns unless well. we get Neil to belt up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Come on. I'm loving all these off the cuff puns. Neil, saw it all up. Oh, Wait, this oh. score got got puns too. Let's go. All this talk about <laughs> pants. All this talk about pants. I thought um, a Kumu virus would come in. Maybe that's where they get hemispheres, the hem of the pants. Oh, oh God. <laughs> no, that's that's from the seat of the pants. <laughs> we need to stop mass logic. producing and get back to tailor-made puns. I don't think virus nice. is going to respond. I think he had to fly. <laughs> <laughs> Zipper. Fly! Zipper! <laughs> yeah, button up, Neil. 
or zip it up. Is that, is that virus I hear? Is he? Is he? Hold on. Shut up. Shut up. Button your lip. Yeah, it was me that laughed. What's up, man? Look, we're oh, we're on the inside leg like now. In let's here. let's all get through this. <laughs> hey, virus! Those pants are yours. You use Orion's belt to hold it up. Was <laughs> <laughs> that around? Who says he wears goes. pants? Maybe he's a skirt guy. Or a kilt. Uh oh. Because they're so many, I don't think I don't know where the kids. <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes he sounds like he's a mini skirt wearer or something. I'm just wondering is, it, wow. is this a drift day or is this a no drift day? kind of day are we having today? Oh, that's a good one. We don't know which side of that fence you sit, Virus. Earth turns underneath, as per Neil deGrasse Tyson's football claim, or Earth does not turn underneath, as per Blue Marble's claim. Which which side of that fence do you sit? Pants or no pants? I don't sit on any side of the fence. I'm on both their sides. <laughs> you understand... Being on both those sides would be a contradiction, right? The Earth is nah. either spinning underneath shit, or it's not. It can't be doing both. So you gotta pick one. Can we see Neil deGrasse Tyson saying that things turn underneath, that the Earth turns underneath things? Yeah, yeah that's it mad frequently. old. Yeah, That's mad old. We've done that. You described it in a football you might, you might game, wanna, Virus. You might want to research a little bit before you yes. get into a topic. He said that years ago. There was a one-third inch deflection to the right caused by Earth's rotation. That's a deflection. That's not actual drift, as per Coriolis claim. He even labelled it Coriolis. Well, that's deflection, he's right. describing, caused by Earth's rotation. What, what part of that don't you get? Earth claimed to be turning underneath the football to cause it to deflect. That's what he's claiming. Also, we have Blue Marble Science who says, and I quote, Earth does not rotate underneath, end quote. So Earth doesn't rotate underneath footballs, according to Blue Marble Science, and Earth does rotate underneath footballs to cause a quarter of an inch or whatever deflection in a football, according to Neil deGrasse Tyson. Yeah, I don't remember Neil deGrasse Tyson saying things spun, the Earth spun underneath the football. He said it was just oh, aided on, by Irish. Earth rotation. Aided by Earth's rotation, yeah, that would be that Earth. Mean... That would be Earth rotating underneath the football. Where, where is the Earth in that, relation but... to the football? Are you hold, on. hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Are you hold on? I right, hold on. Are you saying that you take Neil deGrasse Tyson's position that there's deflection caused by Earth's rotation? I take both sides. You can't. You can't have Earth yeah, rotation you... from Earth turning underneath the football. And Earth not turning underneath the football, no effect to observe. The effect of deflection, right, virus, that effect okay. is claimed to not exist according to Blue Marble. Earth does not turn underneath, no effect to observe. So that would be no deflection in the football to observe according to Blue Marble. Do you understand that? No, I don't, because I don't think that's what he meant. So when Blue Marble said, and I quote, Earth does not turn underneath. You think that's open to interpretation, do you? Yeah, because he was talking about a balloon, wasn't he? Yeah, he said Earth does not turn underneath. Yeah, it doesn't turn underneath balloons. So therefore it won't turn underneath footballs then? Never agree with that. Sorry, Wait, you agree with Blue it? Marble that Earth doesn't turn underneath footballs then? So Blue Marble says it does and turn underneath the football and NDT says it does turn under a football. Well, I think Neil deGrasse Tyson said it was aided by Earth's rotation, which I agree with. And oh, so the deflection in the hot air balloons aided by Earth's rotation then? Because there's no 
aiding anything in the hot air balloon. Hello? Yeah, one of them's just floating straight up and the other one's moving over land, so yeah. So one of them's got a deflection aided by Earth's rotation as it turns underneath, 15 degrees an hour drift, Coriolis deflection, which we all understand here. And the other one, Blue Marble, makes it specifically clear, Earth does not turn underneath. So it's not going to aid anything according to Blue Marble. Now, those two positions are mutually exclusive. Do you not understand that? Well, first of all, Coriolis is at 15 degrees, so we don't agree with that. And we agree, we disagree with what they said. Sorry, firstly, Coriolis so isn't 15 degrees. What, what is Coriolis? Can who you are, define... Who you are define, you define disagree? Hello? 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 Can you define Coriolis effect for me, please, Virus? Yes, uh, the apparent deflection caused by Earth's rotation. So, Earth's rotation causing apparent deflection. According to Blue Marble, there isn't any of that. Earth's not turning underneath according to Blue Marble. So, the apparent deflection that we will observe... According to Blue Marble, there's nothing to observe the balloons not deflecting. So when you say the apparent deflection caused by Earth's rotation, Blue Marble says there isn't any. Earth isn't turning underneath. So not causing something because of Earth's rotation. Nothing to see here, says Blue Marble. Earth not turning underneath. No deflection caused by Earth's rotation. Is that not clear? It's the fifth time I've explained this. There's a contradiction. I know it's the fifth time you've explained it. I don't think you, made it. I don't think you understand the fact that that's not what they're claiming. Earth is not rotating underneath, says Blue Marble Science. That is very clear and specific. Earth not turning underneath a hot air balloon. Yeah? The claim of Coriolis is deflection caused by Earth's rotation. That means the balloon should deflect, virus. No, that does not, that's not what that means. Oh, really? So when I say what's Coriolis effect and you say the deflection caused by Earth's rotation, what deflection do we observe in a hot air balloon? None. So there's no Coriolis effect then? End of your globe claim. According to the globe, we'll observe deflection caused by Earth's rotation, yet there isn't any. Yeah, welcome to flat Earth. How about... Sorry, why are you going to ask me something? According to your own citation and definition of Coriolis, it's a deflection caused by Earth's rotation. I ask you, what deflection will we see in a balloon caused by Earth's rotation? Answer, none. Yeah, that's... So there's no deflection caused by Earth's rotation, then? It's not on a path. It's just... Going... Sorry, there's no deflection caused by Earth's rotation. There should be. That's what you claimed it would be. It's also claimed by Neil deGrasse Tyson to cause deflection in a football. But when we get down to the nitty-gritty of what balloons are doing, there isn't any. So that's a contradiction. Neil deGrasse Tyson says there is. You claim to know the definition of it. That's deflection caused by Earth's rotation. What deflection caused by Earth's rotation in a hot air balloon? There isn't any. End of argument. Earth's not turning. Or there'd be deflection in a hot air balloon caused by Earth's rotation, as per your definition, virus. That's painful. You're looking for Coriolis in the wrong places. Am I really? It would be everywhere at the tune of 15 degrees an hour on an Earth that's turning. So it's not going to be selective. Either you've got deflection caused by Earth's rotation as per your definition of it, or you haven't. It's not an either-or situation. Either things deflect or they don't. They don't decide whether or not they're going to deflect. It's a not actual appearing to happen effect if you turn underneath them. Of course, if you don't turn underneath them, like Blue Marble makes it clear, then you don't see any deflection at 15 degrees an hour. There's no deflection caused by Earth's rotation, as you make clear. How much will we see in a hot air balloon? Precisely none, right? Coriolis is at the You do uh, know Kroom, You right. said that he's not in the right place. Where is the place we can we can see Coriolis effect? It wouldn't be in some stationary. It got to be something that's actually moving. Hot air balloons move. They rise up in the air. Are you stupid? Do you not understand our bloody hot air balloons? It's moving, you stupid idiot. Anyway, wow. anyway. Sorry. Hello, stupid idiot. Are we back to this dipshittery where you are fundamentally retarded in your assertion? You think balloons don't move? What's the point of them if they don't go up, virus? I don't think they move. So it's got an upward vector, so we can definitely detail this with Coriolis deflection. A deflection observed in something moving upwards as Earth turns beneath it. It'll appear to curve as we turn beneath it. How much curve do we see in the hot air balloon as it moves in an upward vector and we turn beneath it? Oh, we've already had the answer. Absolutely none. 
that's a non sequitur. And Sorry, non sequitur. You said it wasn't moving. It's moving upwards. You're just dumb as fuck. Yeah, I also. Yeah, you're dumb as shit. It's moving upwards. So it's got a path upwards. And that path should appear to curve if Earth's turning beneath. It just doesn't because it isn't. We're not turning beneath. And Blue Marble confirms it. Earth is not turning underneath to cause apparent deflection in balloons. I ask you to confirm it. How much deflection will we see as Earth turns underneath this balloon with its upward path? None. That's the answer. Earth's not turning underneath anything. Okay, you're still looking for it in the wrong place. I'm looking for it. No, you're looking for it, Mr. Burden of Proof Reversal Fallacy. You think I'm looking for Coriolis deflection on an Earth that turns? That's not my claim. I'm not looking for it. You need it to occur and it doesn't. You said that we are looking in wrong, uh, but you said that we can see everywhere. How is that possible? Uh, we don't see it anywhere ever. It's not possible. If it was, we'd see deflection as Earth turns underneath hot air balloons. As they move upwards, we'd see a curved path as we turn beneath it. That's the claim of Coriolis. 15 degrees an hour deflection as we turn underneath things that aren't attached to the non-inertial reference frame. Well, that'll be a balloon leaving the non-inertial reference frame, moving up in a straight path, and us continuing to turn underneath to see precisely how much Coriolis caused by Earth turn. Oh, yeah. None! <laughs> how do my balls taste, Virus? I bet my balls are about as salty for you as they were for Blue Marble Science. Quick, get your balls out your mouth, Nathan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what, the balls that aren't rotating underneath hot air balloons to cause not actual deflection to the tune of 15 degrees an hour? We don't see that happen. It moves up in a straight path for us on the ground and for it in reality. We don't see it curving away. But I thought there was going to be not actual deflection as we turned underneath it. That's Coriolis. We should be turning underneath it, right? How much do we see of us turning underneath that hot air balloon again? Virus? None. There shouldn't be any. Behind. Shouldn't be any. So we shouldn't have 15 degrees now deflection as you've defined it. You just defined it as the deflection caused by Earth turning underneath. That's your claim, your definition. We just don't expect to have any now. What, like Blue Marble? Telling us we wouldn't expect to see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We would expect to see it if Earth's turning. That would be the natural consequences of us turning beneath stuff. They'd drift away at 15 degrees an hour, precisely as claimed. We point out it doesn't happen and virus changes his tune. Suddenly we wouldn't expect to see it. Why is it claimed to be seen then? What are you thanking Bob for if you wouldn't expect to see it? Why do people go around thanking Bob for proving we do have this drift if we wouldn't expect to see it? That makes no sense. The drift of rotation is different from the drift. Sorry, what drift? How much drift is there under a hot air balloon? This, that's not how... Precisely none! Hey, virus! Huh? How much drift under a hot air balloon you're about to detail? Thought we weren't expect to see it. You're about to detail how much drift we're not expected to see. That makes no sense. Why are you detailing drift we wouldn't see? That makes no sense. What are you talking about? Nick? The drift that you claim on a globe Earth will see to the tune of 15 degrees now, not actual deflection as we turn beneath stuff, but we don't see it. I've asked you how much we'll see underneath the balloon as we turn underneath it, and there isn't any. So Earth's not turning underneath anything. Earth's not turning. I don't claim 15 degrees an hour. Quarter. Yeah, globe claims that, though. You're just a retard. I mean, literally, you're shit for brains idiotic, so we don't give two shits what you're claiming. You're just a nobody. Meanwhile, the heliocentric sphere Earth model claims 15 degrees an hour drift, Coriolis deflection as we turn beneath. Hot air balloons. How much do we see of it again? That's not how Coriolis... Sorry, you're going to tell me how Coriolis works? How much 15 degrees an hour claim to be turn of the Earth do we see under a hot air balloon virus? If that was the it's the deflection caused by Earth turn you told us about when you defined it. How much of that will we see in a hot air balloon? That's not how Coriolis... Sorry, you're going to tell me again I don't know how Coriolis works and that's not how it is. Yeah, Coriolis effect is the not actual deflection observed from a non-inertial turning reference frame in the inertial reference frame. So an object travelling straight will appear to take a curved path as you turn beneath it. That is Coriolis. I know what I'm claiming. Globe claims we have it. So we're supposed to have drift as we turn beneath a hot air balloon. 
How much drift do we see under a hot air balloon as we turn beneath it, virus? Tell me for the third circle jerk time that that's not what Coriolis is. You wouldn't expect to see it because that's not how... Sorry, you wouldn't expect to see the drift you detailed by definition as being the effect caused by Earth rotation. We wouldn't expect to see what you defined as an apparent... That means you can see it effect. We wouldn't expect to see the apparent effect you defined. What kind of circle jerking nonsense is this? That's Sorry, you just don't understand how Coriolis works. Oh, so I just don't understand Coriolis. <laughs> that would be the not actual deflection observed from a non-inertial turning reference frame as you turn beneath a projectile travelling straight in an inertial reference frame. I absolutely unequivocally do understand what Coriolis effect is. So go fuck yourself, you retard. You didn't know what entropy was yesterday and you absolutely don't know what Coriolis is today. You've managed to read it off presumably some definition you Google searched. Claimed to be an effect observed from Earth's rotation. Well, that's an effect. Now you're telling us how much you wouldn't expect to see it and you don't appreciate how much cognitive dissonance I'm highlighting. You're going to tell me I don't understand Coriolis. Yeah, go fuck yourself. Yes, I do. Why, why would you expect it in a... Hot... Why would I expect? I don't. I'm not a globe-believing fundy retard. I don't expect to see this drift. You would expect to see it. You defined it as being expected to be apparent and then you're going on to tell us how we wouldn't expect to see it, you circle-jerking, double-speaking, fundy asshole. <laughs> okay, so Bloody why do you expect to see it in the I don't! Globalist. You deaf while I get interrupted constantly by chocolate? I don't expect to see it. You expect to see it. You defined it as expected to be seen when you use the word apparent. However, when I ask you how much apparent deflection do we see in a balloon, the answer is none. We don't see what you would expect. And when I point out that we don't see what you defined as expected to see, i.e. apparent, you go on to tell us that we wouldn't expect to see it because you're a circle-jerking, double-speaking fundy. Can I say it better? The globe doesn't expect to see it in a hot air balloon. The globe expects to see 15 degrees an hour deviation from anything that's in an inertial reference frame. That would be not attached to a spinning Earth. It's defined. You can look it up. It's defined as being in occurrence with anything, including aeroplanes. Yeah, that's how it's defined. Anything that's not attached to a roundabout will exhibit not actual deflection if it's travelling in the inertial reference frame. If that's translatable to a globe Earth, globe Earth is the non-inertial turning reference frame and anything not attached to it would be in the inertial reference frame. That includes, but is not limited to, hot air balloons, blimps, drones, aeroplanes... Anything that is not attached to the turning reference frame would exhibit drift if we were turning beneath it. So if we were turning beneath hot air balloons, we would see them drift. We don't see them drift because we're not turning beneath them. Simple as that. That is a straw man. Oh, go fuck yourself. I've got, I'll give you two minutes to detail precisely how that's a straw man. Okay, that is completely a straw man because nowhere can you provide me a globe claim that just says what you said. What you said was not what the globe claims whatsoever. We would not expect to see a drift in a hot air balloon. That is a straw man that you made up because you know we don't expect to see it in a hot air balloon as well. Nobody claims that. So where we see drift? Everywhere but directly on the equator. Sorry, you haven't explained why we wouldn't see it in a hot air balloon. Okay, if you put a why balloon on the equator, sorry, sorry. we'll see it. Hello, hello. Why not? Because in order for it to like experience or show Coriolis deflection, it has to be moving in a straight path with perpendicular or not parallel to the rotation of axis. So mm -hmm. if you're just hovering up what? into the air, you're sorry, not... Hovering up? So you don't understand what words you're using? You're not... Ho right, sorry, you're ho not hovering up. Meaning. Sorry, hovering up. Hovering up. Sorry, hovering up, that's contradiction <laughs> in terms. It's either hovering or moving up. <laughs> okay, well, it's hovering or moving up. Hovering so when it moves up... So, up, okay. So it meets your criteria. Hello? Coriolis. Hello? So when it's travelling up... So, hello? When it's travelling upwards, it would meet the criteria then? No, it won't. Why not? You've just explained the criteria. 
No, I said if it is hovering or moving up, it would not experience Coriolis. Why it not? It be covering... Sorry, loop. okay. So by that example, I take a balloon, I'm on a rotating roundabout, I throw it directly upwards, and in your fuckwit pea brain, you think it's not going to exhibit any deflection when I throw a ball upwards off a roundabout that's spinning. You're wrong. You're stupid. No, okay. That is a confusion between relative motion and Coriolis. Those are two different things. Coriolis effect is the effect observed from the turning reference frame of the ball thrown up in the air, it would seem to take a curved path because you turn beneath it. That effect will happen if you throw a ball up in the air. Likewise, if a hot air balloon moves up into the air and I'm on a rotating platform beneath it, it will appear to take a curved path. So, if I'm underneath a hot air balloon on a roundabout and it's spinning, I absolutely guarantee you it will appear to take a curved path because I'm on a fucking roundabout. Now, if that's translatable to a turning earth, then the bloody balloon's going to take a curved path, Virus, if we're turning beneath it. It just doesn't. Okay, that is also a strong man because of the... No, no, it's not a straw man. Balloon moves up off a roundabout, takes a curved path because it's got turning beneath it with you watching it. If that's translatable to Earth that's turning, balloons take off and they take a curved path, or seem to, because we're turning beneath them. That doesn't happen. End of argument. Not a straw man. It is a straw man. I can tell you why it is a straw man. It's a straw man because of the fact that it has nothing to do with Coriolis. Or Coriolis effect is not actual deflection observed from a non-inertial turning reference frame as you turn beneath objects moving through an inertial reference frame. To tell me it's got nothing to do with Coriolis effect when I detail the not actual deflection of a hot air balloon as observed from a roundabout as you turn beneath the hot air balloon and the not actual curved path it takes because you're turning beneath it. To tell me that's a straw man because it's not Coriolis. Is you being, what's the word? I see... U N T again. I do understand it is Coriolis. This is not a straw man. The fact remains, we just don't observe the Coriolis deflection in hot air balloons. That does not happen. It would if we were turning beneath them in the same way it would if we were turning beneath them on a roundabout. We'd observe it from a roundabout because we're turning beneath and it seems to curve as it moves up. But we don't observe it seem to curve as it moves up on Earth because we're not turning beneath it. Simple. End of argument. No Coriolis to observe. Not a straw man. And I do understand Coriolis. It is a straw man. Yeah, fuck off. Kick him out. Someone close his mic. Shut him down. Don't want to hear it anymore. Coriolis. Close his mic. Shut him down. Kick him out. Not interested. Get lost, virus. <laughs> Akum. Akum. It will be nice. Don't, you don't engage him. Close his Coriolis mic. Effect. Shut him down. Kick him out. Not going to be told three times in a row that me detailing specifically with examples of Coriolis deflection from roundabouts that aren't translatable to a turning earth, therefore aren't exhibiting the same exact effect as being a straw man three times in a row. He can go fuck himself, get lost, don't address him. He's been muted and booted. Muted and booted! Nathan, Nathan, is the Coriolis effect an observed effect? Yes. And where do we observe the Coriolis effect involving the solid earth? We don't. So that means that the Earth is not exhibiting Coriolis effect, so it's not rotating as if it was, it would be exhibiting the Coriolis effect. Precisely. Further to that, if we were noticing not actual deflection in a hot air balloon because Earth's turning underneath precisely as it's claimed to, then that would mean that the hot air balloon could go up and wait for the next country along to come to it as it hovers. We don't observe that Relative either. Relative motion? Relative motion? Are you kidding me? Did, did he, he say, really say that? Did he say there's no citation that says uh, that you're supposed to see Coriolis in a hot air balloon? Yes, he did. Um, the dot go dot com. The main cause of the Coriolis effect is the Earth's rotation. As the Earth spins in a counterclockwise direction on its axis, anything flying or flowing over a long distance above its surface is deflected. This occurs because as something moves freely above the Earth's surface, the Earth moves east under the object at a faster speed. End That's quote. because it's hovering up, chocolate. Hold on, Neil. Hold <laughs> on. Chocolate. So according to that citation, 
anything not attached will deflect, yes, correct? Um, and would a hot air balloon be part of anything not attached? Yes. So according to that definitely. citation, a hot air balloon will be observed to have Coriolis effect, correct? Definitely. Do we observe hot air balloons having Coriolis effect? According to virus, none. Zero, none, nada. We don't experience Coriolis effect in hot air balloons because Earth's not turning underneath. With that, I'm going to say a huge, massive, enormous thank you to both Discord and G Plus panels for making today's after show possible. Of course, a massive thank you to all of you in either Nathan Oakley 1980 or Nathan Oakley primary streams. Hopefully smashing the super chat, liking, commenting, sharing, subscribing, hitting the PayPal link and all that good stuff. Also below this video, you can get £50 for swapping your UK electricity supplier to Octopus Energy. I've been Nathan Oakley and I will see you all in the next video.